spiked out. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely from. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. It's episode number 66. Uh, today we've got a wonderful show with you. We're going to do an Ask Jason and uh, a new segment. Instead of Shark Tank, we're swapping Shark Tank out today for Behind the Startups, in which we will talk to uh, Joey Tran of Fortis, my attorney, uh, and the attorney for Stork Brokers, which you may have heard of. They were a uh, contestant on uh, Shark Tank. And I'm investing in the company. And we're going to talk today about the negotiation, the term sheet, and how we've basically uh, set up the company, the corporate entity, all the blocking and tackling you need to know as an entrepreneur. And we're going to just go through it, open kimono. We're going to show all the documents. We're going to discuss the negotiation so you can learn. And we're going to do this every maybe two or three weeks with Stork Brokers so you can see the marketing plan, the design of the website, project management, all the way up until launch. This may be maybe five episodes of uh, this segment, and I'm really excited about it. And then, of course, after that, we have our uh, interview segment. Raul Sanad is with us. He's the founder and CEO of Geodelic, which is a mobile platform we're going to hear about at the 30-minute mark. So. Uh, we're going to start uh, with the Ask Jason. 15, 10 to 15 minutes after that, we'll be going into the, oh, there we go. All right, so here we go. Uh, Ask Jason. Oh, and I forgot to say, welcome, Raul. Thank you. They jumped the gun by putting the, putting the Ask Jason logo up really quick. Uh, and big news, uh, Trotta, 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 Trotta uh, has uh, decided to sponsor the program. People remember that Neil, uh, the CEO of Trotta, was on the program. Episode 47. On episode 47. He did a great job. So this is an interesting story. He's on the program talking about his SCM business, search engine marketing. Mm -hmm. And we met him in Boulder at the Open Angel Forum. Right. So every time we go to a different city, Tyler sets up meetings with who? Well, when we were in Boulder, we were listening. We had a meeting with him. Right. And we instantly were like, you need to come on the show. <laughs> this right. is really interesting. Really interesting crowdsourcing of SEM. So if you don't have an SEM expert in your company, yeah. they let you crowdsource it. Yeah. And then those people don't work for Trotta. They work with Trotta. Yep. Those people then get to freelance with Trotta. And uh, depending on how much money they make or save you, they, they get paid money. And it's basically like a, because SEMs are really expensive. And yeah. most companies can't hire them to buy their Google ads or whatever. So it's a crowdsource model. So he tells me on Twitter this week, that the show has become the number one referral of clients. And they've made so much money from his appearance on the show that they wanted to pay back the show. And they, they said, hey, and they want to get more mentioned more because they can get more uh, potential clients. So Trotta has decided to sponsor the show. And we thank them for doing that. Uh, about Trotta, paid search marketing is a great way to grow your business online, but it's time consuming and complicated. That's why you need Trotta. Everybody understands that. Have you ever gone and tried to buy Google AdWords and stuff like right. that? You don't know what AdWords to buy. Yeah. Maybe you don't know the foreign language words to buy, the keyword combinations. Those are for the little Google ads you see. You're a local business, you're a big business, medium sized business. You want to buy those keywords, but you may not know the secret keywords. And you have to do all that keyword research and kung fu. And there are people who've been doing this for a decade. They know a lot better than you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Tr Trotta is a crowdsourced pay-per-click marketplace, leveraging the skills of more than 500 certified paid search experts. If you mention Twist, T-W-I-S-T, -T, that's our hashtag, you will get a 100. You get $100 worth of PPC marketing. That's pay-per-click, free for every thousand dollars you spend. So they're going to bonus that's, you 10%. That's a pretty cool deal, yeah. They're going to bonus you 10%. Yeah, it's amazing. If you, if you watch um, that episode. You realize real quick, Neil is an incredibly sharp dude. As, sharp guy. Yeah, and he's got a very cool solution that is going to help a lot of businesses. He's super confident about it. Yeah. He's so confident about it, he's going to give 10% extra to you, uh, up to a max of $3,000 spent. He's got to cap it at something, because you're going to love the service so much, you're going to wind up spending $10,000, $20,000. He can't give you 10% forever, but he's going to give you 10% up to $3,000 uh, that you spend for a $300 bonus. Uh, on average, advertisers who start working with Trot to reduce their CP CPA cost per action by 10%. That's actually what happens after they click. Do they convert into a paying customer? So you see the little ad, hey, come to my local business. They pick the keywords. You yep. pick one keyword like Santa Monica Plumbers. That keyword, Santa Monica Plumbers, that may cost like $5. Right. But these experts might find you something like plumbers, you know, uh, west side of LA. Yeah, but it's not and even that, that may cost 25 cents. The, the real beauty of it is you're leveraging dozens 
hundreds. Ooh, hundreds, potentially, of different minds out there that are, each individually are probably savvier than you are, but when you in aggregate is where the real kind of beauty of that system comes into play. And uh, just as a nice little fun gift, they're going to give away a gumball machine to one of you who thanks Trotta uh, during the show. So say thank you, or you know, this week maybe, maybe not during the show, but from now until the next show. They'll pick somebody who says thanks at Trotta, T-R-A-D-A. -A, I don't know if we uh, mentioned last Pound episode, Twist. though. They, bought, they also just got funding from Google Ventures. Oh, well, that's a huge endorsement. Yeah. They were uh, invested in by Google Ventures. Google is the number one pay-per-click marketplace. There couldn't be a bigger endorsement than having Google right. uh, invest in your company. And uh, wow. I mean, it's really a really cool story that they actually went from being a guest on the show yeah. to, I don't know, a couple of months later, they realized, God, we're getting all our clients from that show. We have to invest. Well, that's what happens when you have 100,000 people downloading every episode. On the phone for Ask Jason, we have Ken. Ken, you're calling from the 717. Uh, where is that? It's uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, and we had yes. a, was Pennsylvania, did Pennsylvania do a meetup on Tuesday? No, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh did. I don't know, I think Pennsylvania did. So uh, next time uh, in September, you're responsible, Ken? Absolutely, uh, yeah, I'm, for, I'm more of a Philly guy than a Pittsburgh guy. Philly's great, love Philly. Uh, Morimoto, that's where Tyler and I go when we're there. <laughs> Um, did you go with me there? The color changing walls and everything? Yeah. yeah. I've, been, I've been there, I don't think we went there together. We didn't go though. there together? No. Huh. Mori, you've been to Morimoto, Ken? Oh, uh, sure, yes. Great place. Yeah. I, got, I got a tip for you. He likes the Heineken uh, <laughs> in the bottles. So when you go to the sushi bar, yeah. buy Morimoto and his guys a round of uh, Heinekens, and they will be happy, and they will give you yeah, a lot of free you gotta stuff. you got to take care of the sushi chefs. Always buy them a beer. Let me tell you something. Yep. That's what they love. They love a beer or a sake. You, yes, just tell the waiter. It's a little tip. Tell the waiter, hey, do me a favor. Can you offer the guys behind the sushi bar a round of drinks on me, some sake or beers? Pfft, they love that. You'll be treated like a king. Forget it. Then you order omokase, and you're going to get seven extra dishes. It's, it's a good, <laughs> like Trotta, it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ken, you have a question. Let's hear it. I do. Uh, I have a program that's in development, maybe 60% done. Uh, website just went live. It's called eroutingguide.com. And what it is, it's a uh, uh, application that's targeted towards companies that ship truckload stuff. You know, manufacturers, um, you know, small, medium-sized manufacturers. So anybody who's got a shipping dock, it, it's geared towards them. And um, oh, the, the idea behind it is, yeah, kind of all along the lines with the 37 signals. Where, um, and by the way, that's that's my background is in transportation logistics. I'm, I'm not a computer guy. I'm a, I'm a freight guy. But the idea is that the technology that that supports the transportation business within large manufacturing companies um, has become very complex and is very expensive to implement and to and to, to run and expensive, um, you know, and, and complicated and all that type stuff. And and what what I feel has happened in that marketplace is the the, um, the the big companies that offer this technology have gotten better, grown and improved. But what's happened is it, it's created this void at the bottom end of the market where there's no real simple um, you know, uh, 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 low cost of entry solutions okay. for smaller companies. And so then your question about that is? Yeah, so, um, so I, I've, the, the, the market, that, market that I'm going after are, you know, say sh guys in the shipping dock or, or shipping people, they're, they're not exactly a real big organized, uh, they don't have a big organized presence online. And so what, what it, I'm, I'm, I built a foundation with Twitter and, and with, with blogging, but I'm having trouble really finding that an organized community online that, that I can target. So I'm looking for any ideas that maybe can help me, that, that I can help find, or maybe even create that you know that community, community and that audience for the for the product. Okay, this is an excellent question. You want to build a simple uh, transportation management software solution. Correct. The solutions that are out there have gotten more and more complex and expensive over exactly. time. So you want to find the people who buy these systems. These are what? Trucking companies, shipping companies. Uh, actually, it'd be it'd be the manufacturer. Oh, so, the manufacturer. Um, yeah. Gotcha. So uh, you want to figure out, hey, how do I get these people uh, as clients? Lead Correct. generation, in a way. Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways to do what's called lead gen. There is my method, which is creating content around uh, creating content and community around that resource and they come to you. So you put out the honey, honey being content, they come and get it. So that could be in the form of a blog that's lightweight and simple. And in that blog, you write about the various companies that they use, the keywords that they use. So mm -hmm. you write about the people 
who you want to uh, engage, and you write about the things that they're talking about. It could be, and so you call it Shipping Times or the Shipping Report or something like that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Create a little Google group about it. And name it something memorable, like TechCrunch is memorable because crunch is like, well, it's a little odd, you know? Um, or this weekend is very memorable because it tells you what you're, it, it carries with it what you're going to uh, get, right? A weekly program. Yep. Tech crunch is evocative uh, because it evokes something, crunch, something's crashing, whatever. Uh, so create a really good brand name around shipping uh, and those issues. Uh, and then do content consistently. Create a Twitter account with the same name, something that's very, very followable whether it's a color plus shipping or whatever. So people know what they're getting and they remember that second keyword that you add to it. Um, and then, of course, there's, we talked about Trotta, not to promote a sponsor, but SEM is another solution for finding those people. They do searches, yeah. you buy the keywords, and then you ship them to that blog. Or you ship them to a landing page explaining that you have a solution that's better. And if you want to learn about the landing page business, that's a whole artwork. And uh, a lot of the SEMs out there do that. So if you do searches for SEM and landing pages, that's a good place to start, which is how to use uh, links cost per click that you buy to go to a landing page. If they go to that landing page, maybe you give a report. Here's a report on the top solutions out there, including your own. And it's a white sure. paper. And if you, to get the white paper, you just fill out this form and get the free white paper. Uh, those are all ways to give a little to get a little. What you're trying to right. do is get contact information. You've got to give something. Raul, you listen to this. Uh, any ideas? What do you think of the advice I gave? Um, yeah, I, I think it's good. I, I think um, the you know the question I have is: Are those uh, manufacturers like are they internet users? And and it seems like you know it's not your standard kind of you right. know. I think they use the internet less than you do probably. But um, you know if if they are going after that, that's great. I would also look for you know potentially because you're trying to reach a non like super digital audience like try to understand are there trade press blogs is there maybe even some channel that everybody's using some other company that you know oh this is in everywhere yeah see if you can hook on to that okay yeah, Tyler? That, that makes sense that's good advice Tyler any advice from you over there um, well, well what happened to your camera did they fix the yeah it's weird the camera looks finally oddly, fixed the focus oddly clear oh good uh, any advice from yourself? No, I thought you just reiterating your point. Great. Uh, in the chat room, I see some people saying, are there logistics conferences, too? That's a great way to do things. Yeah. If they are offline, uh, an interesting thing to do would be to send them a flyer. Because they do, if, even if they're not online often, they're going to be on, they have to be online at times, right? None of these sure. people are going to be offline 100% of the time. Uh, so if you can go collect their names, uh, or just get shipping department at your top 1,000 contacts. If you were to send them a white paper on you know, whatever you created, and you think about, well, that costs $5 to ship and print, and it costs $1,000 to write the white paper, you get a good professional writer to work with you. Now you can take that whole cost, $1,000 to write the white paper, um, $4 each to send it. Now you got $5,000 in total cost. You send it to 1,000 people, and it costs you $5 each. If your software costs $500 a year or $1,000 a year, you've got to get five to 10 people to uh, sign up for the software uh, to break even. So what you do is you put a cover letter in it. And the cover letter is handwritten or somewhat handwritten, maybe hand signed, maybe a little note at the bottom, and have the envelopes handwritten. So you hire a couple of interns who have neat handwriting. And, and you pay them a dollar to handwrite the envelope. Shipping attention, shipping department manager. And it's just a white labeled envelope. When I get that handwritten note, you know, uh, and then you put on the bottom, white paper enclosed. They go, oh, wow, what's that? Interesting. And if it has the name on the top left-hand corner that says, you know, shipping magic or whatever, the shipping, you know, really tech crunchy kind of memorable flicker like name that you come up with, launch conference, yep. whatever it is, uh, boy, is that going to work. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah, getting, getting the names I don't think is a big issue, so, or a big deal. So. Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to follow up. Another good idea uh, is uh, we had David Hansen on from 37 Signals. You must be aware of the 37 Signals product line, like Basecamp or High Rise. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, we, you see how their landing page works, where it's like we have three different sizes or four different sizes, and one of them's highlighted and expanded, like this is a good size to get. 
that sort of solves the tyranny of choice for pricing. That's an example of a good landing page. They, they're pretty expert on those landing pages and highlighting things in yellow and keeping them simple. And the only things you can click on or do are submit your information or buy. So they're not trying to promote their blog or this or that with that landing page. They're trying to direct you to the one thing they want you to do, give us your contact info. Uh, and so those are all different possible strategies. Uh, and then there's also the press strategy. You can look up Grasshopper. Uh, which did an interesting thing a year ago where they sent chocolate-covered grasshoppers to everybody who was a <laughs> top blogger for their, I don't know, it was customer support. I can't remember what they do. Maybe it's CRM software or customer support, but I do remember Grasshopper because that's an interesting name. Uh, and they sent chocolate-covered grasshoppers to me, and the first thing I did was tweet it, and a bunch of other people did. So uh, that's the purple cow, Seth Godin type stuff mm -hmm. uh, that you can try. Uh, yeah. Try to match it. Be creative and yeah. test and after you test, see how it did. That's another critical thing. So measure the cost per lead. How much does the software cost? Um, I, I, it's based on user fees. So Average you know, the low-end simple solution, five bucks or up to you know hundred bucks a month. Yeah. So uh, anybody who's going to use this, five dollars is too cheap. Anything worth using is basically priced at the cup of a Starbucks a day. Twenty business days a year, three bucks a day, maybe fifty dollars is a better price. But anyway, you'll figure that out. Um, and then you just figure out what your average. What your average uh, client is worth? Their average client is worth sixty dollars, one hundred twenty dollars, and once you know that, you can work backwards into what marketing solutions work for you, including buying SEM, sending a five dollar packet. If your software costs five thousand dollars a year, man, you could send five dollar packets with a five dollar tchotchke in it, you know, a pen or a pack of grasshoppers, till the cows come home. Because you're, and that's what the grasshopper people realized. When we can send a thousand of these out for forty dollars each, and I think they outlined it on their site how they did it. They're like, ah, I can blow forty thousand dollars because our average customer is ten. All you need to do is get four. Uh, you might not have that luxury, but then you just have to think, well, what luxury do you do have? Well, maybe you can acquire people for a dollar a click, get five hundred of them and convert, get you know five hundred clicks and convert two. And now you've broken even. If you break even, and they become reference clients and they email other people and they get a year free if they refer somebody. You know, you get a little affiliate thing going too. We could go on and on. Uh, great question. And is there a Twitter account that people can follow right now? Uh, yeah, uh, eroutingguide.com. Eroutingguide.com. So everybody, yes, uh, do our friend uh, a favor and uh, follow eroutingguide. Uh, great. great call. Thank you. Good job, Ken. All right, have a great day. Thanks, Jason. Okay, that's what we do. Pretty simple, huh, Ron? People call in with a problem, we try to help them. Uh, it's basic stuff, right? You probably do this all the time. Uh, not yet. <laughs> no? You're not a first. You, you're a second time entrepreneur. Yeah. You must have done this. Yeah, but I try to solve my own problem usually. Solve so your own problem. Busy I'm not saying that you have them. to help everybody, but I'm saying yeah. the solutions, you, you've dealt with these problems. Yeah. Yeah. Marketing and figuring out marketing costs, it's a yeah. pretty common problem. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, though, um, for eroutingguide.com, like it's a new product, so I'd almost, I mean, a great question. He's going to have that problem, but my question would be like, since you're 60% done, do you need to reach like 5,000 people, or do you need to get like 10 um, mm. pilot customers on board? Figure Ten, out what they two. need. <laughs> if, if you already have your list, maybe you have a contest. Tell me your biggest shipping problem. Win an iPad. Get yep. all the responses. Pick 10 of those people. Mm. You know, for if you're only going to charge them five bucks, you might as well give it to them free for six months. Make sure the software works. Yeah, they have. I'm on their on their website right now. Your routing guide. Decent looking website. They explain what they are right on the top. And five dollars a month free trial any e routing guide product for thirty days. So they sort of have that going. Um, but you're right. I think a freemium model could be the way to go too. Give them the software for free, get them addicted, and then upsell them on the second user or, you know, their history or whatever backups. You know, it's all kinds of different things. Okay. So uh, now it's time uh, for our new segment. Where I think let's see, we started the show at 108. We did the Ask Jason at 114. I'm trying to keep track of the time. Now it's 120. 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific, and it's time for Behind the Startup. Wow, I like the graphic. Well done, Kenny Chen. That's a graphic that looks good. I like it. Uh, with me on the phone is Joey Tran. Joey, how are you doing? Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Joey is my very, very busy uh, attorney. He's busy oh. working on... I don't know how many companies I have. Joey will tell you. It's too many. <laughs> too many companies. Uh, let it's me all get good. all good. Let me get the phone here. On the speaker phone, we'll see if this works. Uh, we should have Sterling Hawkins, my partner in Stockbroker. Sterling, are you there? 
I am here. How are you guys? Uh, good. Let's see. Can everybody hear? Everybody okay? Everybody in the chat room, this is the first time we're doing a two-caller thing. Uh, everybody tell me, did you hear Joey well? And uh, can you hear Sterling okay as well? I'd just like to get... you can Joey, you can hear Sterling, right? Yep, I can hear fine. Great. Sterling, you can hear Joey. I can. Perfect. Wow, technology. Hey, Sterling, how are you doing? Awesome. Uh, so next time we'll wind up having two Skype windows and it will be even better. We'll have like a whole three-way thing going here. So let's see. Uh, Sterling, you were on This Week in Startups. Does anybody know what episode? Tyler tends to have a good... Sterling on, on uh, the... Which Shark one did he call in, in? Yeah. I don't... I'll look it up here. I'll have like... to look it up. Sterling, do you remember what episode you were on? It was 56. 56. So 10 episodes ago, roughly 11 weeks ago, 10, 11 weeks ago, you were on the program. You pitched us on a great idea. Uh, tell everybody the idea one more time, Sterling. So the idea is Start Brokers is an online marketplace where parents can sell all their kids' outgrown toys and clothes, shoes, car seats, cribs, craters, and all those things to other parents who are looking for those same things and don't want to pay retail. Great. Perfect description. Sterling is basically getting parents who have a zero to 18 month old or an 18 month old to 36 year old to take their old clothes, their old toys, all this stuff, put it in the lot, take a picture of it and sell it to another parent. As a new, as a parent, as a new parent, uh, I heard of this idea, I said this is great and I said to Sterling, I love this idea for a business, this is a business I might invest in and uh, actually Joey happened to be listening to the program, he heard uh, me make an offer to Sterling of uh, what did I make the offer of? One million, one million dollars or something like that? Yeah, one million dollars for one percent. Exactly. It was a hundred million valuation. No, I said to him on the phone, this is a great idea. I'd like to be involved in the building of it. I'll give you $25,000 for 20% of the business. Sterling said, sure, pending due diligence. We did a little due diligence. We got comfortable with each other. Uh, it felt like the right thing to do. Joey said, this sounds like a great idea. And so we're off to the races. Uh, and so maybe, uh, Joey, can you take us through essentially the process by which you, uh, what you first discussed with Sterling and what your concerns were about me investing in the company. So maybe your concerns from my perspective as the angel investor going into the company, uh, and then we'll get into Sterling's concerns and what he should be looking out for as having me in an, as an investor. Right. So they're sort of both in the, in the same way at the initial stage. Uh, Stark Brokers started off as an LLC, which many uh, startup companies do start off that way just because of the uh, sort of the corporate structure and the ease of formalities in running the company as an LLC. Um, but however, the LLC entity is not always the best entity to receive funding, uh, especially if you're planning to build a company that's going to be growing and receiving multiple rounds of funding, which uh, Stark Brokers uh, definitely plans to do. So the first thing that we needed to think about uh, was to uh, convert the company into a Delaware corporation, a C Corp um, to be specific. And we chose Delaware only because uh, it's very easy to work with the Delaware Secretary of State. Um, the case law there is uh, very well set. Uh, it's predictable. Um, and we know that uh, the Secretary of State is uh, very accommodating to startups and companies in general. Um, that's you know, in consideration of any other jurisdiction that we typically work with. But you'll see that most VCs tend to uh, prefer investing in uh, Delaware uh, C Corps. The second issue coming from both sides, not only from the company's perspective, but also from the investor's side, is just how the IP and how the capitalization of the company is currently um, uh, structured. So one of the issues that we did discuss was the IP, thinking about where all the information and all the you know, web designs, uh, trademarks, domain names, um, where they're residing, whether with the LLC or with individuals. And in some case, a lot of startups do have them in different parts because um, founders would, uh, for example, file things like a domain name under their own name before starting up the company. So after we took a, took a look at the IP structure and we're, we felt comfortable with it, the next stage is to look at the capitalization and look at really how to work with the stock, um, the current stockholders to get them to uh, convert the company into a uh, Delaware corporation and get them prepared for um, an, sort of an angel round. Um, as an investor, one of the concerns is always how fragmented the stockholder base was going to be. And in this case, you know, for stock brokers, there was a little bit more um, in terms of the number of stockholders that were uh, that we typically see in a startup. But that's just merely an, an, an issue that we have to deal with. Um, and address. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we talked with uh, Sterling 
uh, that I thought was a very good uh, sort of going back and forth was how he dealt with his stockholders, or in that case, back when his LLC, it was the members, um, talking to them and working together with them to really ease the process of converting the company from an LLC to a to Delaware C Corp. Uh, one of the issues that we addressed from the company side was just how the membership units, the voting and equity percentages would be translated in a Delaware C Corp. Uh, because as an LLC, they can structure any way they like. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, to, to uh, Sterling's um, uh, character, he, you know, stepped up and did take uh, a good look at the capitalization, a good look at the voting. and. Uh, decided at the end of the day to convert some of the shares and percentages that he had to more of a pro rata based um, conversion, which then we got into uh, the Delaware C Corp. So as of today, after we went through that, those two big issues from the beginning, we are now looking at a very clean Delaware C Corp that's ready to take in the first round of the financing. And we are at the position now of uh, finalizing the financing documents, as Great. I'm sure you're aware. Okay. So uh, just to recap a little bit there, uh, one, uh, a key issue is, is this an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, or a C Corporation? A C Corporation, a Limited Liability uh, Corporation is a partnership typically. That's how a lot of people start a company uh, when they're starting a small business or a consulting firm. Uh, but, and, and the benefit of that, correct me if I'm wrong, Joey, is one-time tax. So if that company that I own, an LLC, uh, makes uh, $100,000, and then I want to take that $100,000 and put it into my personal bank account. I don't pay, uh, you know, a corporate tax and then a personal tax on it. I pay tax once. Right. It's a pass-through entity. Yes. Yeah, so the tax passes through one-time tax. Now, if you have a corporate entity, like a C-Corp, if stock brokers were to pay a dividend, they would be paying tax to the government on their profits, and then each of the individuals would get a dividend. They would get their percentage in shares, and they would have to pay tax on that again, correct? Correct. So right. if you're doing a small company, an LLC is great. But when you want to start to grow up and be a big company and get a lot of shareholders, C Corporation time. Right. Correct. OK, good. So now everybody understands that. Now, in terms of translating, we want to be a Delaware corporation because you said Delaware is the most favorable to startup companies uh, in terms of litigation and other things. Does that mean we have to have an office in Delaware? What do we have to do uh, to have to become a Delaware corporation? And why do we see so many companies originating from Delaware, Joey? Well, Delaware requires a statutory representative, representative um, that's located in Delaware. But most of the times, you don't need an office. You just need the statutory representation. Um, and most filing agencies provide that representation for a, a sort of a nominal cost per year, anywhere between $150 to $180 per year for that statutory representation. So you don't actually have to have an office in Delaware. You just need that statutory representation. Um, the benefits of it, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that even though you're not based in Delaware, you can be based in California, which is what we typically see, you still need to also consider qualifying to conduct business in the, the jurisdiction in which you're located. Um, but when you look at the overall cost transaction-wise, sort of dealing with the, SC, uh, the Secretary of State and dealing with sort of the case law, um, the benefits outweigh the sort of the nominal annual cost that you have in paying the, the you know, Delaware franchise tax or the uh, statutory representation fees. So it's more, it's just preferred because a lot of the documents that you see in financing um, are actually based off of Delaware code. Great. Uh, and so the last issue before I get to Sterling's side was IP. I should, as an investor, an angel investor, or even if I was just beginning to become a partner in the business and go work there and get equity, I should say, hey, wait a second, who owns the IP? IP stands for intellectual property. Who owns the domain name? Who owns the trademark, if there is one? The, the copyrights to the work that's been created, the code, et cetera. Maybe there's some innovations. Uh, why am I so concerned as an investor about the intellectual property? Why is that such a major issue when you come into a company? Well, yeah, there's there's two points. I mean, one, obviously, you're going to be um, investing in the management of the company and whether or not the management is going to be able to run and grow the company. But um, what the company is based off of, the product, the services, is based off of that intellectual property that the um, individuals contribute to the company. Um, so you want to make sure, one, that the company owns all that, uh, that 
in IP so that they can build off of it and grow into a, a real successful company. And the second thing really is to make sure that there aren't any sort of stragglers out there or IP license holder or IP holders that the company is going to be sort of held hostage by um, as it grows because they forgot to get the proper assignment into the company. You don't want to go through you know, two rounds of financing only to find that sort of a small yet key component of your software is actually owned by the developer because you never executed the proper consulting agreement or asset assignment agreement. You mm -hmm. want to make sure that all that is already sort of captured within the company by the time you invest moving forward. Um, and this is like sort of a, a key issue for startups because uh, the startup environment is very fast, very flexible. Uh, entrepreneurs are doing things sort of, um, you know, shooting at, um, at the hips and- Maybe even it, recklessly. It's somewhat, but, but that's the point of, of, of us getting involved is to take a look at the picture and the story of how the IP was developed and how the company's growing um, and then try to make sure that we kind of just like grapple everything back in. Um, it's also going to be an important issue from the IP standpoint because every company in every single transaction afterwards is going to make a representation that they own or possess um, sufficient rights to the IP to conduct business as currently contemplated. Um, so if you don't have that uh, IP in place, you can't make that representation, which means that if you sign the agreement with that representation, you're, you're already in breach. And that the IP rep is one of the biggest reps that uh, right. most investors will look for. So the, the person who is uh, owning the company, the CEO, has to make a representation like, hey, I am saying that I own this IP. And if, God forbid, this thing blows up and somebody makes a claim, they have some responsibility. We're actually seeing this play out right now. Uh, Perhaps it's fraudulent, perhaps it's true, perhaps the truth is somewhere in between. There's no way for any of us here on this call to know, but Facebook has a lawsuit right now uh, that claims, we have no idea, again, if it's true, this could be totally farcical, that he was hired by somebody and apparently he was hired by them to do some level of work they've admitted. Um, and now this person is claiming that they own 84% of the Facebook because the contract says, and who knows if this contract is true or not, uh, Facebook has said, Facebook representatives actually said this week, this may in fact be, we don't know if this isn't a fraudulent signature, which is sort of a weird way to say it, but um, basically this is an IP-based issue where they're saying we hired Mark Zuckerberg to create this product for us and we were supposed to get 50% ownership in the Facebook for $1,000 and 1% for every month that it was late. It was X 34 months late and we own 84%. It's actually going to court, correct, Joey? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the courts right now. It's a fascinating thing. Okay, Sterling, uh, you've heard all of this. You are the founder of this company, uh, and you actually are, uh, your day job is you're an attorney. Correct. Uh, so take us through the part of your decision making, bringing me on as an investor, and all of this trouble, uh, and all of this extra work to become a, a C corporation, talk to the existing investors, how did you uh, come to the decision? How much work was it actually? Um, and uh, what were the, give us some color on the uh, um, uh, discussions with the previous investors and why you were doing this. Sure, sure. So there, I mean, there are a great deal of concerns when you're, and I don't say concerns, that sounds you know, sort of negative, but a great deal of issues that you think about and you talk through and, and you think through when you're doing this type of thing, when you're when you're on this side of the transaction, you know, one of them obviously is, you know, who's who who the investor actually is, you know, and 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 what they're what they're bringing to the table. Because in your discussions with your your other partners, your other shareholders, you know, you 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 sort of have to sell them on the idea of you know agreeing to all this and being in the same in the same boat with you as as another shareholder. So. You know who this investor is, how, who they bring to, you know, what they bring to the table. You know, in terms of the money they put in, but also, particularly in this case, you know, the other value that you know that you you know bring to the table as well. So, you know, talking through those things, you know, sort of filling them in on your resume and explaining to them how Wikipedia is not the best place if you want to read about <laughs> Jason. Right. And uh, and you know, going through, going through those issues. And uh, let them listen to some of your your Jimmy Wales you know comments. <laughs> so uh, so that's sort of unique to this to this transaction, this particular investment. But you're you know you're talking through these things with the, with the folks. You know other things that are always important in any transaction like this is you know valuation. You know 
the difference between the valuation when they got in and the valuation that you may be getting in as at, you know, and, and, you know, so these things sort of all relate, you know, so it's the valuation yeah. that you're getting in. And if we're thinking about the dollar amount that you're putting in, but also the real value that you bring to the table, sure. which is really worth a lot more than, than the dollar amount. Right. You know, a couple, you know, there are other things that we kind of think through as well, you know, in, in, on this side of the table, you know, one is, you know, control, you know, how much control or voting authority is, is this new investor or any new investor going to have, you know, on the one end, it's, you know, it's, you know, to have someone who's very experienced, you know, a serial entrepreneur who's been through a lot of these things before made a lot of the mistakes that we haven't made yet. And also some that we have made in, you know, in years in the past and sort of learn from them, you know, you think you want to talk to that person as long as they're, you know, as often as they're available to run ideas through them to kind of bounce things off your sounding yep. board. At the same time, if there are things that you need to do when you're running the company and decisions you need to make, some even, even minor decisions, but even in, when they're not minor decisions, you don't want to have to always go to that person to get their blessing, get their consent, right. you know, on, everything, on every single thing. So, you know, it's kind of a balance between letting that person have enough control so they feel comfortable getting involved. They know that you know, the founders aren't going to run off and do anything silly. Yep. And at the same time, making sure the shareholders, you know, the current shareholders and, and the founders are also comfortable so they can still right. run the company as a, in the best way for the, the benefit of the customers and the shareholders. Right. So existing shareholders were informed of who is this guy uh, and what is he going to uh, bring to the table for his investment. He's investing at a lower valuation. He's getting a pretty good deal. Is he going to bring a lot of value to uh, the company? And as I told you, my idea is I get in a lower valuation and I'm incented to build the company more because uh, we're both uh, going to be compensated ultimately the same way, uh, which is by the ultimate exit on this business or sale of this business or it becoming a great standalone business. Uh, and so in terms of control issues, Joey, as an angel investor and um, a non-majority shareholder, well, what should I expect? Not much, right? what I would call customary protective provisions. So protective provisions means certain covenants that are put into the charter um, of the company that essentially requires stockholder consent, uh, the, uh, the preferred stockholder consent. So there are certain like, customary prote protective provisions that you, would, you should expect to see. Things like um, not being able to amend the charter or the bylaws in a way that adversely affects your rights. Um, not being the company should you know won't be able to uh, affect the liquidation of the company uh, without your consent. Um, the company can't increase the number of shares of the preferred stock or common stock without your consent. Uh, so those are sort of the some of the general. Like the other is de you know, declaration of dividends or redemption of stock that's outside of the stock option plan. Right. Um, and, lo and a lot of this has it comes back to sort of a core rationale, which is um, it's protecting. It's making sure that the money that the, that's invested in the company is used to grow the company, yeah. not used to sort of further any sort of um, uh, other uh, objectives of the company. Right. Um, and also to make sure that the company doesn't sell um, it, itself uh, behind your back and then you end up not getting the full value or not having a chance to, uh, to advise the company as to the success or um, favorability of, of such uh, an option. So those are protected covenants that I think you should expect. And I think the other ones um, in terms of management, most angel investors hopefully should expect very few in terms of management um, in the sense that um, you should let the company have the flexibility to run its run its business uh, without having to double check and get, you know, so for example, yeah. the receipt investors, to, uh, directors consent on every little thing. Yeah. Uh, there, are certain, there are certain covenants that I think are appropriate from both ends. One would be, um, any kind of occurrence of debt. Uh, at the seed round, you're only talking about twenty-five dollars to $100,000. So there's not a lot of money um, that's going to be put into the company. It's enough just because of the overhead and the sort of the business plan to give the company a good runway. But then again, you don't want the company to go out and incur $50,000 of debt right, right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, because then that gives a security It has a interest. negative impact on my investment. So basically exactly. just, you can't, you're trying to get me some rights so that these guys can't dilute, dilute me by adding a bunch of shares, sell the business to their friend, sell right. the assets to somebody, take on a load of debt. 
could be from their right. friends uh, right. or disperse that debt and now all of a sudden I own a company with a million dollars in debt. Uh, all great stuff. And so uh, now we've gotten to this level, signing papers this week. I think there's one issue left which is do I give um, first right of refusal if I sell my shares to uh, Sterling and to the existing company? I think that's reason, somewhat reasonable since I'm a small shareholder and if I was going to sell it to somebody I don't want him to have to run his business without first having the chance to buy the shares back. There's some reasonable protection for me that he has some time period to do this, like 10 days or how? Correct. Yeah. Uh, Correct. That's, that's all negotiable. Yeah. Um, but typically there is a, a finite period in which they must exercise uh, the right of first refusal. So if I want to sell my shares to Toys R Us, Kids R Us, I can basically get a price from them and then I go to Sterling and say, hey Sterling, I'm selling my shares to Toys R Us. You have 10 days to buy them or they go to Toys R Us. Correct. Yeah, so I think I'm fine with that. So I have all the signature pages. We're going to do that this week uh, or this weekend and then we do a wire transfer and then uh, Sterling and I have been working on uh, having a PR social media firm engage the company as well as a um, uh, design firm and a, build, uh, a firm to build it. So what we're doing is we're going to trade equity uh, in each of these things uh, to each of these parties, including Joe. He's going to have a little equity. He's going to get to wet his beak. Uh, and I've been letting Sterling uh, make those decisions, but I've been introducing them to people, him to people. So he, I introduce him to two design firms. He's going to figure out which one he wants to choose if they want to do it. Looks like they both do. You already spoke to our PR social marketing person, correct, Sterling? I have. I've spoken with uh, with all of them. Right. And so we're basically earmarking, I don't know, maybe up to 10 points of equity, 8, 9, 10 points for service providers. So in lieu of fees, they would have equity in it, which of course makes them uh, more driven. And that's what we'll talk about in the next two uh, episodes of uh, making uh, the startup, behind the startup. Joey, uh, all of this work would normally cost uh, about how much converting to from an LLC and then raising a tiny angel around like this? Uh, I mean, you know, upwards of ten thousand plus. About ten thousand dollars, Sterling. That's your experience as well. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah. So we get Joey to do it. Gives me his customary JCal discount since I do build so many companies with him, and then uh, he's going to work for Equity. So as an attorney, this is a great deal for you. You work for Equity and you get a little promotion. Joey, how can people find you or reach you? Um, you can find me on the web at uh, www.fortisgc.com. Okay. Um, and they can always feel free to uh, email me at jtran at fortisgc.com. Okay, jtran at fortisgc.com. Uh, right. And you work in the Valley. You work with a lot of popular startups. And uh, you've been my attorney since, uh, well, the start of Mahalo and a bunch of other companies. I appreciate uh, all your help with this. Uh, Sterling, I will be talking to you uh, next week. And uh, wow, it's a pretty good segment. Took a, took a little time, but well worth it. I think everybody learned something. And I will talk to you two gentlemen uh, next week offline. Great. Thank you. I was going to take more time when you get lawyers talking. Always takes more time with the lawyers, I know. Joey, does this count? Being on the show count <laughs> towards our barter deal or not? I don't know. I don't no, know if it should, because you're getting some pretty good promotion here. <laughs> All right. Very good negotiation. Right. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Thanks, Sterling. Cheers. Thank now. you. I'll talk to you, Sterling. Okay. Well, that's going great. What would you think, Robo? Interesting? I, I, I think you may have gotten a really good deal, but, uh, but that's... Uh, well, here's I, the thing. But if you can add enough value, it's good for everyone. Here, here's my thinking. Tyler, you, since you work with me a lot of, on uh, the portfolio that we've been building, uh, when I angel invest in a known entrepreneur, uh, I get the known quantity, and I invest $25,000 at a million dollar valuation. Uh, when I have an, a, a, a startup that's outside the valley or one of the major cities that nobody knows, that has a really good idea with an unproven management team, I'm going to have to do a lot of the work. Whereas if I invest in Gowalla, basically I write a check and uh, you know, I talk to Josh from Gowalla sometimes, or, but he doesn't need my advice. It's more casual than that. Same thing with Blippi, you know, et cetera. So, in these cases, I think I'm going to have as much fun or more building this company. And if I get to own 20%, it's sort of like I'm a founder slash angel, which I'm trying to figure out which will be, give me a greater return, investing on somebody like Phil Kaplan at Blippi or Josh at Gowalla, all incredible people I feel very privileged, Backupify, Rob May, Challenge Post, et cetera, GDGT, 
but I, you know, I'm very small, small owner, you know, like low single digits, if that. But in this case, I get to own double digits. Maybe it's a better deal. And enrolled in is a, a deal I'm trying to do similar to this. Um, so just out of curiosity, why wouldn't you take a little common founder stock, put in the 25K as a convertible, and then like it, it, it doesn't make it a really low pegged valuation. So in the future, yeah. you might get a, a bigger bump. You'd still have the same thing. You'd be common, so you'd be on par yeah. instead of having that preference that kind of really doesn't matter at that level. Yeah, preference doesn't matter at that level. I think I, I thought about that, and my thinking was I would like to be viewed by the management of the company as an investor uh, and you know, sort of on that tier, as opposed to being thought of as one of the guys you know, building the business. Yeah. I want to be thought of as, you know, this group of people, not this group. In the companies I start, I'm that group. But in these companies, I want to be, because I'm going to set up the angel round. So when I go into a meeting with other angels, I want to say, I am part of this pool. And when we do the, you know, Series A, I'll participate as well, and I'll be part of that pool. And I don't want to be part of both pools. So we sort of pick a pool, because I don't know if I, it's a good idea for me to be in both. I don't know if it's a bad idea necessarily, but I don't know. What do you think, Tyler, of how, how it's gone so far? You're definitely more engaged in, you stock know, brokers. in stock brokers, and um, it's um, yeah. The other one's kind of a passive investing, and this is a very active yeah. style of investing. Yeah, and I'm I'm one of one investor typically, and in, in this kind of situation, I'll typically be one of one investor in this round, as opposed to one of twenty investors in these other sort of deals I'm doing, but. Uh, I'm very happy with the way this is going, and you know, I think my value add as a co-founding angel or founding, I think founding angel is the perhaps the best way to say these deals. So enrolled in, who also pitched on the show, I had here by the office, and I, I put an offer on the table that's, uh, I think I have a pretty aggressive or, uh, offer, but uh, I'm going to need to do a lot, even more work on that business because they're first-time entrepreneurs and they're not attorney like Sterling, but um, I think this might be my model is become the founding angel where I give the first money and I'm part of the founding team. Uh, anyway, that was interesting. Yeah, I think it'll, the real benefit will come in kind of future rounds, the, the value in time saving and all of that, and when it's ready to do a, a bigger round. Yeah. But, uh, if he's outside, where, where is he based out of, Sterling? Uh, they're in Atlanta. Yeah, so I think that's going to be a huge benefit. I think that would be a benefit. I mean, if you look at this weekend, the network that's now doing a million dollars a year in revenue, I brought in Sky Dayton and I brought in Matt Coffin, who are personal friends, and we each put $100,000 in, and it was, I think, a million dollar valuation. The company was a lot further along, had a half million dollars in revenue and a couple of employees. Um, but we'll see how this goes. One thing I do know that's going really well is DNA mail, DNA mail. Everybody loves DNA mail. They provide fully hosted, managed Microsoft Exchange and Google Apps email. It's just much more economical. You pay by the user. There's no other cost. You don't need to buy servers. You don't need to have IT staff. They have all that for you, and they are reliable. 99.9% .9 uptime guarantee. And man, you do not want to be managing email servers and doing all that IT work. Uh, if you are a startup company, DNA Mail has been with us from the beginning. They have sponsored, I believe, every single episode of This Week in Startups uh, for over a year. And they are our biggest supporter, or amongst the biggest supporters of us and the network. And I thank, personally thank them. Uh, you too should thank them on your Twitter account. Thank at DNA Mail and at Trada, T-R-A-D-A, uh, for sponsoring Pound Twist. Great job, guys. We really appreciate your support. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, Raul, thank you for being patient. I didn't know how long that segment was going to take. It took a little longer than I thought, but I think it, people get some value out of that. When you're starting a company, everything takes a little longer than you think. Isn't that the case, huh? So now, this is your second startup. This is, yeah. Uh, tell us about the first. I'm curious as to what was your first startup, because you had an exit before this, right? Yeah, so um, the first startup uh, was based in Seattle and in like... Uh, 1998, 99, I got enamored with MP3s because I was a really big music fan. Yeah. And I basically wanted to build uh, something like what's now Rhapsody, like an online subscription music service. Back then, nobody knew what that was. If you said online yeah. music, they thought like CD Now, like you know, selling sure. CDs. Um, so I was uh, working at Microsoft. I tried to kind of start it up within Microsoft, and um, there was a little bit of traction there and then a little bit of 
kind of non-traction where... Were you an engineer at Microsoft? I was like your... a, what's called a program manager, so kind of product manager designing product. Ah. I used to design like Word, the Word processor. And oh, you I, were on the Word team, really? Yeah, and then I um, switched into the digital media group because I was really interested in the um, music type stuff. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I talked to one of the VPs there and he's like, uh, Microsoft, we just aren't going to do hosted software. That's not how you do, how you <laughs> do the business. This thing and, is not <laughs> how it's done. No, but that was 10 years ago. Yeah. So, um, uh, but Can we it, put it in a box and sell it? <laughs> right. Then we might be interested. Um, but anyway, so, so left, it was kind of back when you could take a PowerPoint and raise a few million bucks, um, yeah. kind of, if you remember those days. And, Good uh, times. Yeah, I got a few colleagues from Microsoft, a few from Adobe where I worked before, and we had kind of a big startup starting team, and we were going to do this music service. We plugged along, went like three months, hired a lawyer, like an IP lawyer, like for like music IP, not for like... Yeah. And uh, got like a $30,000 bill for like research into music issues, and then right. the next day we said, okay, we're out of the music business. This sucks. We're moving into <laughs> video, because video had like for a lot of esoteric reasons, like very different laws around it versus, sure. versus music. So same technology, not much different between music and video in terms of online. And so we switched, switched to video and uh, um, had our ups and downs. And like around 2002, there was a lot of people having downs. And Yeah, the we whole were, market was yeah, down. Yeah, so, uh, so then we got... Um, end of the world time. Yeah. It was the, the end of the world um, era. The stock first, market first crash. end of the world. The first end of the yeah. world. Stock market crash, 9-11. Yeah. I mean, 2002 was as dark a year as I can remember in my lifetime. Much, Certainly much darker than the crash in 87. And I think darker than the financial crisis we just went through. Yeah, well, well the financial crisis we just went through, I think, was for the financial industry maybe darker, whereas the earlier one for the tech industry was much darker. Was, Correct. Yeah. WWW2. Yeah, World War Two. No, WWW two. W. It was the World Wide Web's. Uh, but it, you know, you're right. It was a finance related, yeah. the housing bubble. During the whole financial crisis, I said, "Wow, this is going to suck because all the advertisers are going away, and you know, the economy is going to be down in general." But uh, why are the tech companies still reporting solid profits? And they're laying people off, so the profits are going up. It actually uh, was counterintuitive this last one, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. it was actually not so bad in retrospect. Yeah, and, and maybe we can come back to in retrospect, yeah. I think, s some of the dynamics that that now has today. But just to finish, the last company we were doing hosted video. Um, the idea was if you wanted to publish video on the internet, there's a lot of like really hard stuff that if you're like a cable company or a big broadcaster, yeah. you don't want to do that. That's just, and a lot of them tried to because back then everybody decided they were going to become an internet company. But like to do good internet software it takes a certain mentality that a lot of companies just don't need to have. Yeah, it's a level of focus that a, a, a company that is making 99.9% .9 of their revenue somewhere else is just not going to have. Yeah, so we were kind of the back end for big deployments, including like Verizon Wireless and Hulu and CNBC and other cable companies and started selling to telcos. So uh, sort of like a Bright Cove before uh, Bright yeah, Cove? Yeah, it was kind of a pre-Bright Cove with a little bit more of a an enterprise software model. Bright Cove kind of was a little bit more of a, we're a network, we're a advertising Yeah, they content. had, well, they, I think they, Jeremy was going after like yeah. three businesses. It was like, we're going to be an ad network, yeah. we're going to be a destination site, yeah. and we're going to be a platform exactly. for people. I mean, yeah. I think now he's way off of being a destination, way off of being an ad network, and they're just a platform that people pay for. So yeah. actually they basically came to your business. Yeah. Uh, and people would pay you. So you were an enterprise business. Yeah, it was like subscription revenue, uh, you know, kind of like you'd pay Salesforce, but it was mm -hmm. kind of for higher end, so kind of 5,000 minimum type of engagements a month, yeah. recurring revenue. And the business was sold in 2006 to? Comcast. Comcast out of Philly, actually. Yes. We were just talking about. Known for buying internet companies, uh, known for buying them at a decent price, actually. They bought Daily Candy. They bought a bunch of companies. Yeah. Uh, how did that go about? Did you have a banker? Or did they come uh, calling? Did you call them? No, so they were a big customer of ours. They ah. were, um, y you know, huge, obviously, MSO operations, cable TV, but they didn't have a massive internet platform. So when oh. they started moving to internet services, they said, hey, how do we jumpstart this? Mm. Looked at us as a opportunity to do that. And then, um, you know, figured, okay, we're already building on this, let's, and this is an industry service, and I think, um, you know, Brian Roberts has a strong, like, uh, uh, bent towards entrepreneurialism and figuring out how to really 
you know, take things to the next level. And I think uh, this was viewed as kind of a way, you know, I think everybody knew at that time, you know, the writing was on the wall, YouTube was starting to ramp up, but at some point TV is going to be all IP. Now, you know, people have been saying that for a long time, but it became very apparent then. Comcast is about video and TV, so, you know, the idea was this is, you know, about the future. Uh, so it was a good exit. It was a good exit. Now, again, 2006, uh, pretty frothy having sold the business around that time. Pretty good time for an exit. Yeah. It went up a little bit more until 2008, but then quickly fell off a cliff. Yeah, exactly. So, like, so you, your you, timing was almost perfect. You, you, you were like right here at the peak and a yeah. little more peak and then big drop off. Yeah, so, you timed we, it pretty great. If we'd waited for YouTube, maybe we would have doubled uh, it or something. But, maybe. Uh, but if we'd waited too much longer, it would have been, you know, you know less so. How do you reconcile that as an entrepreneur? I mean, this I get criticized all the time that I sold Weblogs Inc. too early, and at the time I sold it, people were criticizing AOL for buying it because they said, what are you buying? You're buying nothing. It's just a bunch of domain names and an 18-month-old company with four full-time employees, and you're spending tens of millions of dollars on it. As an entrepreneur, do you, how do you reconcile in your brain, I sold my baby, I put X number of years into that. It looks like you put, what, four, five, no, uh, six. 98, six years. You put six years of your life into it, you sell it, and then you've got to go back and play Monday morning quarterback and say, if I held it, it would have been twice as much at this date, 50% more at this date. If I missed it, I would have, you know. How do you, how do you deal with all that? Do you think about it? Does it keep you up at night? Yeah, uh, I, no, it def definitely doesn't keep me up at night. Like, but, but you think about it a lot, and you're like, well, how do you optimize that? And it's a really hard thing to do, and, and the odd thing, like, we're discussing is there's kind of these macro cycles of hype and trends and you know what's hot and and then other macroeconomic stuff that you really don't know when the right time is to sell so you can use your gut I, I think as an entrepreneur there's also like a lot of just personal questions like am I still loving what I'm doing you know do I have something else that seems more interesting you know how much equity do I have in this company have I kind of carried out the mission to the investors you know can they you know, get to a place, or can the employees get to a place where, you know, people are happy? So, I, I, I mean, I think, like... It's a multi-layered test. Yeah, and, and it's, 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 if you just try to always optimize the money, I think you tend to make wrong decisions. Absolutely, yeah. right. I mean, Mark Cuban told me he got offered, I don't know if this is public, he told me he got offered like $100 million by Microsoft a year before they sold for a couple billion to Yahoo. Yeah. Maybe it was two years. And... I mean, can you imagine? He wouldn't be Mark Cuban. He'd still be working. I mean, he, he wouldn't be running. I mean, he still works, but I mean, he runs a basketball team. Let's be honest. I mean, how much work is it to go to a bunch of basketball games? I mean, he, he works hard, but I mean, it's uh, all opt-in. So essentially, you have to s take into account, do I love this business? Is one of the things you mentioned. Uh, have I done my sort of geary, my responsibility to the investors who I took money from? And is my timing good? And is there something else I love more that I could be doing that would be creating more value? And also, what is my equity like? Have I fully vested? Yeah. And is there any more upside for me to be here? Which is very self-serving, but you have to think about it. You were over four years. Did you go back to the, to, as a founder, can you go back to the board and say, I want another equity grant for the next four? Um, or did you? you? No, like you, you could, but like, like the, the thing is, once you have a big company, getting a lot of equity in it is really hard. Yeah. If you have a tiny company, getting a lot of equity is really easy. Right. And so the math on that tends to be that if you want a lot of equity, um, it's probably easier to start another company. <laughs> yeah, especially <laughs> now, after you've you, raised a yeah, bunch of money. Now, yeah, now you've got to build a business, which is kind of the yeah. downside of it. But, uh, um, yeah, so... It's kind of lonely, though, to build a business alone and be, it's a lot of weight to be the 80, 90% shareholder in a business, isn't it? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I totally um, think that uh, the dynamic of having other people in it there with you and kind of just, just the, the emotional kind of um, perseverance you need as an early stage entrepreneur, even if you've done it tons of times, because um, it's just you don't know what's happening, and, and probably you're in a market that's moving fast, and you know yeah. Google could do X, or Microsoft could do Y. Or I mean, basically, you're constantly a moment away from being uncovered as a total fraud, <laughs> depending on where you are in your business oh. plan. You know, like either a fraud or a failure, but um, right. Yeah. I mean, when I say fraud, like you know, I, I don't mean necessarily like fraudulent behavior, but I mean, I was being a little hyperbolic. But you, I mean, if you're if you haven't built your business to profitability 
it's not a real business yet. Yeah. So therefore, 95% of venture back companies are, you know, they're not there yet. It's not a real business. You're still in that. And, and that goes for Facebook and Twitter, too. I mean, they were not real businesses until there's a profit, right? Uh, so it is a lot emotionally to carry, like, God, can I get this over the finish line? Is Google going to come in and wipe us out? Is it a good idea? Uh, yeah. And, and there's, I, I think with so many entrepreneurs I've talked to, there's, like, for really successful companies, they're like, oh, we almost went out of business three times. Like, you know, we're literally, right. there was something that almost did it, and then they became, you know, a billion-dollar company or whatever. So, like, you are going to hit those issues, and you just have to persevere through them. And if you don't have the... Uh, kind of willpower to do that. It's hard, and, and it's much easier, I think, to do it with supportive investors, with supportive co-founders, with sure. you, you know, people it's, around uh, you that are in the same boat. It is much easier. I mean, with this weekend, this the program you're on is part of a larger network with three angel investors and two sort of founding employees, and it's much easier to have that weight spread out across a group of people. I guess if you pick the right people. So fast forward, you sell the company in 2006. What now? Do you, do you work there for a year or two? Yeah, so, you know, there's some financial stuff and you tend to make some commitments for a transition yeah. and what have you. Earn out. Uh, yeah. Orderly uh, uh, earn out. How long did you stay? Um, so I stayed 18 months and one day. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, on that one day, are you ready to go? Do you have the idea fully baked for the next thing? Or do you know what you want to do? Or do you say, I'm going to take six months off? Um, so I, uh, I started getting really interested in um, GPS technology like while I was still there. Like while, you know, we were working with Verizon and they'd come out with like EVDO modems, like little you know, yeah, broadband sure. cards that are in everything now. Um, and so I was one of the like, first people to get one of those. And then I got like a $30 Microsoft dongle and plugged it into my PC. And I was like walking around with GPS and broadband on my like huge you know, laptop. And, um, it just fascinated me. It's like, wow, this knows exactly where I am, and it knows the businesses here, and I can do a Google search in this park and learn about it. And, and, and I just became just like I was with the kind of MP3s when I started the platform. I'm like, this is really something. It's basically when you get fascinated and infatuated with something, much like love, uh -huh. women, guys, whatever. It, it's sort of like that for an entrepreneur, isn't it? It's something you just, it, it clicks in and you go, I cannot. Stop thinking about this. Yeah, and, and I think in, in some cases, there's also like a, this is going to change, you know, the industry, the world, whatever, significantly, just because, like, when you're on that technology curve, whether it's streaming video that you know, like, oh, wow, all this, you know, that used to be shipped around on DVDs is not going to be anymore, or whether it's GPS, where, like, wow, you're going to know where you are, everything, and connect to the Internet. Like, it, it's... Like, at that point, you're like, okay, this is big. So you're infatuated with something that's going to change the world and uh, that you're one of the few people who's actually tracking that trend. I mean, it's sort of a special moment. It's like, it's like uh, the honeymoon period in a way. Yeah, and, and I, t like, uh, for better or worse, and often I think it's not great to be really early to a market, but, like, like when I first kind of see that, that's when I get infatuated. And luckily so it takes me, like, a couple of years to actually, like, get the business up and running, so I'm right. not like way too early because... So you're meditating on this. Yeah. And as you're meditating, you see things like, what, Foursquare or... Oh, no, this is way, 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 before Foursquare. way, so yeah. What do you see that becomes so pressing in your mind that you gotta, you gotta build a product around it? You see Google Maps on the iPhone? What is it, what was the thing that you saw that said, this is gonna be a business? No, no, no so, so, so it was the opposite. Like, what I saw was, nobody was doing anything, and it's like, ah. geez, I'm walking around with this GPS, and I've got internet, and I can, like, Quick Google search. I know all the stuff around me. Nobody else uh, does. Like, why is all it, the tools are here? All the tools are here. Like, no the product. form factor kind of was super heavy. Yeah. But like, I figured, you know, give it three or four years, the form factor will be fine. It'll be so, your phone. Yeah. And so we started in you know April two thousand and eight, um, and then like three months later, iPhone three G comes out. And it's like, wow, you don't need two or three years. They, you know, it's Steve been Jobs delivered did it here. Yeah. And, and, and that really, once that happened, then everybody else... So if there was a crystallization point, it was the, three, the 3G the three iPhone? Uh, it, it was a crystallization that the market is here now, and right. you can't kind of, you know... It's ready for a company. Yeah. It, it's yeah. actually a platform to build and, this And on. it's ready for, like, execution. Often you can start a company, and you keep two or three people, and you kind of get some lead time. You don't need to, like, you're laying the foundation. You can do right. this more thoughtfully. But then when 
something like I, I, I mean look at look at what's happened when we started in April two years ago there was no App Store there was no GPS phone like right. the you know that would browse the web like the iPhone right I, I mean that's just over two years ago like now the world has changed significantly in 24 months yeah again again and it's yeah. changed like you know, you know now it's Android you know yeah. uh, overtaking iPhone and you know whether it's quite there yet or next month or whatever what do knows, you think the, what do you think the next one is then I mean in this location space is it the iPad uh, is the iPad as revolutionary as what the, the 3GS was? yes yeah, so the interesting thing is like the location space is kind of a um, like a cousin to the mobile space like the right. mobile space is like the big you know thing that's yeah. kind of moving forward and locations like an element of that and it's a really powerful element of it but um, like I think the y you know what we have now is like siloed apps and everybody's all hot on them yeah. and I think what the really next big thing is is like HTML5 where the web goes to your phone and applications like you don't need apps to do what you do in apps now it's just the web right. and, and people like you know think now there's the web and there's apps yeah. they're, they're really the same thing they're, they're, it's like a transitional technology issue about so do you, you know, think the apps get wiped out by HTML5 and there people just say you know what I'm going to write once or do apps uh, and the do apps become runnable on the web um, or, is it, or are they going to be two buckets? I mean, you're sort of saying they're coming together and it's a transition, but do, do we see a reason to create, you know, does Foursquare need to have an app to do what they do, or can they just do it in Safari in the next so version? So in five years, definitely not. In right. three years, they probably have an app and a web version. It's like, okay, you can get Outlook, and just, you know, like your exchange hosted yeah. um, people. They, right. you know, they sell these back-end server, and you might have Outlook on your computer, right. or you might go to mail.outlook.com or whatever right. and get something that looks pretty much like Outlook, but it's a web app. Yeah. And, and so that's what's happening. Like what used to be a really heavy thing that you had to install, now just right. becomes the web, and it's pretty good. It's not going to be like the search. It's not as stable or as fast and snippy as the. Yeah, the, the, the weird thing about that is like not as stable and fast. When I find an Outlook, I try to search an Outlook, I can't do it. But like in Gmail, which is all hosted, in fact, yeah. search is incredibly good. So sometimes the. Like what you get that's really nice on app is responsiveness, it's right. fast, like things switch around, like you don't have to go back to the server. So if you're manipulating the rendering issue, stuff. Yeah. Then it's really important to have an app, but like now, you know, you you have them both. But but the trend is toward like, did Facebook ever have an app? No. Could they build a desktop app? Yeah, but you just don't need it for what they. I mean, doing. and and people like Seismic have, and certain nerds use Seismic or TweetDeck yeah. to to use it, and other people don't. Sure. Uh, you're listening to uh, Raul from Geodelic, the CEO and founder, on this week in startups, episode number 66 from the ThisWeekend.com network. Uh, if you have a question, you can submit it on Twitter with the pound twist hashtag, uh, and we will uh, do our best to answer it. Or you can put it into the chat room by using on Ustream the Q colon mark. So if you have any questions for Raul, do let us know. Uh, so uh, all this leading up to uh, Geodelic. Yep. Uh, and I have my, uh, the website up here on, the, uh, on my uh, desktop, uh, and you can see it. And I'm looking at the screenshot of Dodger Stadium uh, and a bunch of great reviews uh, from CNET and other folks. What is Geodelic? Yeah, so, so, so the, the fundamental premise that we uh, uh, see at Geodelic is that um, just like, like in the um, you, you know, mid-90s, like somebody would come and say, hey, you need a website. And, and, and the, you know, the company would be like, you know, we got a lot of brochures. I think we're okay, this web thing. I don't know about it. But like, you know, two years later, by 97, everybody realized they need a website. That's how you yeah. can communicate with users. It's much more efficient. You know, you can change it. You can, you know, everybody can access it. There's zero, like, marginal cost for distribution. Um, and now everybody has a website. You know, I type in Hyatt.com. I'm sure the Hyatt website's going to come up. If it doesn't, my phone's broken or the server's broken or something. Um, what we're seeing now is because everybody has a phone when they walk into the Hyatt or when they walk into Whole Foods or into um, Dodger Stadium, like there's an equivalent that um, uh, you need a website for people who are there. And, ah. and, and that website for people who are there is now an app for reasons we talked about because sure. it's a little bit faster and nicer. But if I walk into the hotel, I actually, like I'll never go to www.hyatt.com when I yeah, walk into the lobby. Yeah, because that is designed for me to book a room, exactly. not that I'm in the it's, lobby it's, looking for 
where the concierge desk is or what the hours of the concierge it, are. Exactly. That's designed to get you to the venue because right. that's historically what it is. And once you're at the venue, what do you have? And, and nobody cared before because nobody was walking around with the internet before. Now everybody's walking around with the yeah. internet. And so you need the equivalent but optimized around how do I as a business engage with my consumer? Right. I've got this track. How do they do that? I mean, I'm walking into the Hyatt, let's use that as an example. Yeah. And I take out my phone, yeah. I load Geodelic, or I loaded a Hyatt application, what do I do? Yeah, so you should be able to, like the app might be called Geodelic, or it might be called Hyatt, or you know Google mm -hmm. Maps, or whatever, but at the end of the day, that app kind of knows where you are, and it pretty much knows you're at the Hyatt. There's databases of where everything is, anybody mm -hmm. can license them. And so, um, you know, at Geodelic, we, we have these, we know you're in the Hyatt, and we say, hey, the, you know, it's the Hyatt here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give the opportunity for whether it's the Hyatt or the stadium or, um, you know, the uh, Coastal Commission for Malibu Beach or Santa Monica, the, their tourism bureau is adopting us, so when you're on the promenade, you can learn about things, to start talking to you just like they would, like if it was a website, so they right. can engage you. And, it, and Engage you knowing that you're there. Knowing that you're, that you're on there. site. Right. With, with that Not that you're coming to Santa Monica next month, but you, you're here. Exactly. And, and, and so that's much more important. If you're at the BMW dealership, who wants to talk to you? Of course, BMW does. Maybe other people like service uh, um, stations do. Maybe Edmunds does. You. Maybe Carfax does. Ex exactly. So, yeah. so, and if you're in the showroom of the BMW dealership, that says a lot. Like it's, it's, it's kind of profiled what you might be in the same in way. Doing. A Google search for BMW tells uh, the search engine some explicit fact about you. Yeah that you are interested in BMWs, being in the BMW dealer tells you even more than doing a Google search. It, tell, it says it's the real world equivalent of a keyword. It, it, exactly, and, and the subtle difference is for the keyword, you actually need the user to take an action. Mm -hmm. But in the location world, you get the same type of information, but the Passively. user doesn't need to take an action, right. you just which know makes I'm it here. much more um, frequent, like because you're always somewhere, and there's right. always something you're telling about people through your context, and that's location, that's time, maybe that's like, you know, if you're in a car going 70 versus you're driving around at five miles an hour, you might want some parking. Who controls this experience? Is this something where Geodelic is going to say, Here, you're at the BMW dealer, we think you should look at Carfax, Mercedes, Audi, and here's a story from the New York Times yeah. about Audi being the new BMW, yeah. or does that BM, does BMW corporate, or does BMW the local location? Yeah. So, Who so, owns it? Yeah, so our strategy is to say, um, we are going to create a national guide for the United States where wherever you are, we're going to try to pick what we think you would care about and use some algorithms and you know, make some assumptions, aggregate content. And, and we think that's interesting and adds a lot of value. But we think what is much more interesting is to say, we're going to give anybody the tool set to do the same thing. So if you're at the Hyatt, the Hyatt definitely wants to talk to you, but maybe um, TripAdvisor wants to give you information too. They should be able to do that. Um, maybe um, if you're uh, at you know, Yankee Stadium, it might be MLB or it might be the Yankee team. You know, it could be either. And I think it's really unclear as to how that progresses. But what we think is that if we can give the tools for engagement, and when we talk about engagement, it's, it's content, it's like social sharing, so you can you know, find things, share it with your friends, it's some kind of like um, you know, loyalty or incentive or games, things like that, and then also maybe discounts or offers. So we want to make sure that it's really easy for any entity to offer these um, applications that provide those to um, end users based on their location. Got it. Uh, and so how is it going so far? It, 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 how, is, is, are people downloading the Geodelic uh, application or are you going to be in, in the directory and who's building it, you or the public? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that sort of the blocking and tackling of it. Yeah, so, so it's... Um, and by the way, that question, are you going to create all the data yourself, is from uh, A. Ron Norse. God, people pick weird names. Uh, but yeah, he's, uh, that, that's their question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Give so, them credit. So, by so, the way, when you see me looking down at the monitor here, it's not that I'm not paying attention to you. It's that I'm looking at, that's why these guys have the switching. They switch the cameras when I'm looking down here, but don't get thrown off by it. Uh, go ahead. Who, who creates the content? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think, you know, 
We start off by licensing content. Ah. Um, but, but I think to build a kind of modern internet business, you need to take advantage of the fact that um, you know, there's a lot of content coming from different sources. So our goal is by putting these tools out there, we enable both institutions like you know, hotel chains and tourism bureaus and um, retail stores uh, to create content, but also kind of, you know, motivated end users like, you know, prosumers. So if I want to create yeah, a guide the to top the top 1%. Yeah, exactly. The, the, you know, maybe the same people are writing along Amazon and Yelp reviews, but if they want to say, here's my list of, you know, favorite like sports things to buy, but here's my favorite sports bars in LA or favorite, sure. you know, museums or cultural institutions. So license supplemented by power users. Yes, uh, institutions supplemented yeah. by by power users, yeah. and and our model is that like you put your content through us, it's still your content. We're not taking ownership yeah. of it. Like on a Yelp, like you write a review, but then Yelp owns it. In ours, they own a you, license to it, I guess. Yeah. yeah, if you're Universal Studios and you're creating your park guide, it's still all your content. You own all the copyright and everything. But so we're if just you want to use it somewhere else, you could. Yeah, they we're will. giving you the tool set to do that. Ah. We're giving you the tool set to know that oh, if you're in front of the ride, I'm going to try to tell you that there's a. Um, front of the line pass you can buy versus at yeah, the food. Yeah, what I have to have it? Because it's interesting that you mentioned that. I was at Universal. I brought my family there. Uh, my parents were in town. My brother and his family. We got the front of the line yeah. pass, which was very cool, by the yeah. way. If you go there on a holiday, you have to do that. I mean, yeah. it's incredible. The lines are an hour too long. Um, but I wanted to check in, and when I used Gowal and Foursquare, they actually had the rides. Yeah. So I was checking into the ride. I did like it was a great day for me in terms yeah. of check-ins. I checked into the Simpsons ride, et cetera. But Universal not there yet to make their own iPhone application. It's crazy. Yeah. So so that's what you know. We we did a um, prototype with them for an event, and now the question is, you know, how do you take that to the next level for park experiences? And the, you, you know, the question we ask businesses is, you know, when somebody comes to your business, be it a theme park or a hotel, like. Do you want them going to Gowalla to check in? Do you want them to going to Yelp to review the rides? Do you want Google to be selling ads against your yeah. location? Um, ah, yeah. And typically, the answer to those questions is no. You know, I don't. That's probably not optimizing it for me. Right. So what we're saying is, okay, why don't you create your own branded version of this? We'll give you the features for check in, for sharing something out, and sure. it won't be kind of just like somebody tweeting, "Oh, King Kong is cool." Like it should be very managed. Or if you're in a casino and you why wouldn't there be uh, the King Kong ride and everybody who checked in on it on the Universal site and what they thought of it? And their review. I mean, yeah. Universal or any amusement park, Disney, not having their own iPhone, geo-located, uh, geo-empowered iPhone app or Android app is insane. How could they not have that by now? So, so it's. it's I mean, happening. it's not insane. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. it's. You know, I, I will say with companies like that, there's a lot of intellectual property issues, and there's a lot of things yeah. to um, overcome. You know, the bigger the company, the yeah, we've all more been. We've all been. There. You were at AOL. You know. I was at AOL. You were at Comcast. Yeah. yeah so, so, um, but I, I mean, I think what's going to happen, and this is kind of the premise that we're building the company on, is when you walk into that, you know, hotel on your business trip, end of next year doesn't matter which of the major hotels you're in they're going to be talking to you because if yeah. you know if they're not talking to you then it's going to be TripAdvisor or Expedia sure. or Orbitz or whoever and and if they do that or you're checking into Guala instead of you know yeah. into whoever that is not going to optimize things for the brands and it might yeah it was just like people go read the review of the hotel at hotel chatter or something yeah. or you know hotel guide instead of going to your hotel and seeing the photos that you took of the place as opposed to somebody's camera phone photo of the of the place uh, you're listening to Raul Sanad. He is the CEO and founder of Geodelic Systems. I'm Jason Calacanis, the host of This Week in Startups here in Santa Monica on the thisweekend.com network. That's like a call out. People who just caught the show. We've got a couple hundred people here watching it. Uh, if you have a question, you can ask that in the Ustream chat room, ustream.com slash thisweekend. Or you can ask it on Twitter by using the pound twist hashtag. Another question from the chat room, who owns users' location data? I think that's a pretty easy one. Uh, what's the answer then? <laughs> I don't know. You're the expert. Um, so, so, so I, I think it's you know somewhat ambiguous. I mean, I, I, what Apple has done, I think, to their credit, is they've kind of set the standard, which is before you give the location, you get a couple notices. Yeah, every you can time opt, you can opt in or out. Mm. Um, if you opt out, your apps tend not to work, so it's a very unsatisfying experience. If you opt yep. in, then uh, whoever's service owns that location and what their policy is, you don't yeah. read. 
And um, should there be a third bot? Like really uh, yes, but anonymous. Uh, I, I think that's great. At Geodelic, we never make you give your name or anything. We, we give you like an ID, and so we can kind of personalize things so for you. So you ID but we what? Their MAC address no, or their IP? We use just a random number. So, so right, we, but is we, it tagged to an IP address no, or something? we don't tag but it. But you could do that, right? Yeah, we tag it to the device, so to we know device. it's the same device uh, coming back. So if back. you see me come to Mahalo 20 times, yeah, and we, then we know I go to X you know, sex store or something, yeah. You would know well. Somebody from Mahalo who works there is probably going to the sex store. Yes, so. and, and and it's a little like if, it's like search data too. I mean, if you know everybody searches, yeah, yeah. all those and, people on AOL. And, and if the company that's getting that type of data really wants to be very you know nefarious, you can figure out oh this person's you know driving to Brentwood or whatever, and yeah. they're staying at this house at night, and then they're going here. Like you you could learn a lot now, if the application was loaded at that time. Yeah, yeah. Now, now what in fact happens in the industry is there's so much data coming in and such that you're barely just trying to optimize. Like you're not worried about except where people for the are bad going. actors or the hacking that occurs. I mean, yeah, if somebody yeah. were so, to so, if so, somebody so. creates a persistent Foursquare uh, and people use it, yeah. and I hack into that system, I could stalk somebody and know where they live, et cetera. I mean, yeah. this is this is, there's a lot of issues around privacy and location data, no? I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, th I think they're not terribly dissimilar, like you said, to what you find on search and such. So I, I, I think location takes it another step. But, but it's really like interesting um, in terms of the consumer value that you can kind of get. If you look at the market, people opt into giving their location just by massive percentage. Like there's very yeah. few people so who don't do that. So people are willing people are making the trade off. Yeah, they're making the trade off. I'll risk my stalker, you know, being yeah. enabled with knowing where my home you is know, and the and, point oh oh one percent chance that happens. Yeah, and and it seems pretty low. Like so far, you know, it hasn't hit the news where people are getting their house broken into and stalked or anything. Not yet. Uh, question uh, is the accuracy of geo hardware good enough to support hyper local interactions? I find that I have to tell them where I am. I have this frustration sometimes. I'm an investor in Goala, and I tell Josh, like, gosh, you know, it's like a, it doesn't know exactly where I am. H how close do you think it will get? We'll be able to say, like, you're in this side of the stadium, or you're, oh, you're yeah. in this I mean, seat. I mean, already, if you're, like, um, you know, in Southern California outside on a sunny day, like at a theme park or on the promenade, like, 15 to 30 feet is very. Uh, common in right. terms of accuracy. So I know you're either in front of this store or the next one, maybe yeah. one over. Um, but Maybe but, a bank of five stores or something like yeah, that. But, yeah, but that's rapidly improving. And again, when, you know, when I started two years ago, like the best phones for GPS were terrible. Like you'd hold it up and, you know, you're just in Santa wait Monica. and wait and wait. <laughs> and now, like, you know, with the new Android and iPhones, they lock in fast. And it starts this way, but then it triangulates in and you know the technologies are Wi-Fi sniffing and triangulation and now like with um, like uh, the new LTE technologies that are coming out that's going to improve then there's things like um, pressure sensors that are now two bucks um, that can go into phones that will tell you floor by floor where you are elevation is wow. still a big problem so if you if you take it like three years down it's going to be very accurate it'll be a suite of location technologies it should pinpoint you within a few feet in many cases. Why don't they have a button on here, just like I can turn off my, heart, on a hardware basis, I can turn off my speaker. Shouldn't there be a hardware button that I can turn off my geolocation? I mean, I, can, I guess I can turn off geolocation services in the Yeah, hardware the buttons menu. I think are really expensive. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely do that under settings. Yeah. Da, da, da. So, if so I mean, find if, it. if you, like, it would be a niche phone for like, um, Privacy nuts. People who go from Mahalo to sex stores. So. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm just, you know, Tyler can't ask himself, so I gotta ask. Uh, so, any other questions here in the chat room? Da, 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 da. Let's take a look. Who do you think will, do you think Miami will win the NBA championship with Wade, James, and Bosch? What do you think? I think there's a good chance. Next year? Uh, Did LeBron make the right decision? Um, I say always go for the sunny, warm weather. Like that's really? Okay. Well, in that, well, then he should be playing for the Clippers. Uh, the, the correct answer is he, J, LeBron James made the wrong decision. He should have gone to New York and led his own team to a championship instead of phoning it in and taking the self-entitled uh, route. Let's get Lon Harris in here for the news. Lon will be in here in a moment. About 15 minutes late. About 15 minutes, we're done. You have to be somewhere. You did a great job. The people were saying you brought it. 
Like Raul is the man in the chat room. And brought it? Brought it. Oh. You brought it. A little more? Yeah. Okay, Lon's coming in. Here he is. Looking dapper as always. Look at the beautiful shirt, the great suit jacket. Lon, the yeah, creative director. Hair's a little out of control, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. Maybe we get a, a haircut this weekend? I think so. I got some You're time starting to look like you're. Uh, I have, were you listening to the interview with Raul? I, I was, yes. Yeah, fascinating stuff. It so, is, and uh, it's an interesting point about the geolocation getting it exact. I think that's such a that's such a pain point in some in some ways with these products. There's so much promise there, but if it doesn't know exactly where you are, you're searching. It has this it whole layer of complication. It takes too long to search. I hate that. I mean, and then you have to like Foursquare lets you cheat basically. To like you're in this area, pick any place you want to be, and then right. Koala takes longer to check in because they have to. They have to prove you're there. Yeah, it's right. Very frustrating for me because I feel like. Which, yeah, that's well, it's interesting because if it's a game, you don't want people to be able to cheat, which is a big issue. Which is on what Foursquare. people do on Foursquare. People just checking into everything. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you make money by building these applications for the the companies, well, or well, I'd unknown say, right now? I, I, yeah, a little, but a little of both. We, we we do carrier licensing deals, so like all the carriers now know that location is important, and they want to start enabling their ecosystems to build. Um, uh, you know, location applications. So that's mm -hmm. a big source of our revenue. And then we feel that every enterprise, just like they're paying to maintain their website, will be paying to maintain their mobile website. This will just be an extension of their mobile website. Mm -hmm. They're going to need infrastructure to do that. But we think, you know, the big value here is if you can create a network of sites and provide, you know, both consumer and, um, you know, enterprise value by, um, you, you know, letting them advertise, letting them acquire traffic from other places, and letting them sell their own advertising. So we're working with partners where they're selling advertising and giving us a rev share mm -hmm. back ah, on that. Very good. Uh, they're talking in the chat room, Geodelic is free on the iPhone. I downloaded it the other day and was actually using it last night just before the show. What would you think? It's great. No, it's, yeah. it's, I, I really like, I mean, it's the, the UI. It takes a second to kind of get where how it's working with the carousel, but yeah. it works really well and it zeroed in on where I was Exactly, and I like that how it's sort of divided. And the um, one thing that they're doing that are not not a lot of other uh, ones of these location-based apps are doing is Wikipedia. So you can yeah. actually see what are the interesting like yeah. landmarks and history of the location you're in. There's a bunch of uh, yeah, so like free ones that are not so good. Actually, there's one this week that they did okay. on the iPad. Wiki something. Wiki hood. Yes, Wiki hood. Wiki right. hood. Yeah. Yeah. So so we started with a lot of content and aggregating content, and now we're adding social features, the standard check-in type of things, and then yeah. we'll very soon be adding kind of um, elements uh, around gaming mechanics. So as a business, how do I engage with my consumer? Maybe it's a, um, you know, go to these five places, get some prize type of, or a, a punch card type scenario. Yep. And, and then also, we, we think another big area is around financial incentive, discounts, offers, coupons. Yeah. So, so those are kind of the, you know, pillars of consumer proposition, and we want to put those into the hands of brands Content to engage their consumers. Content and plus deals, Groupon plus Foursquare plus Wikipedia. It's a, it's a good value proposition uh, yeah. in the chat and, room. And, and, and really being the you know best use of the Facebook graph for for mobile for businesses to really like you know kind of do their social graph optimization. Yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat room says it's a closed platform. It's an AOL. Is it a closed platform? You have APIs uh, it, or? It, 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 I, I would say that's a fair statement right now, just okay. due to the fact that creating an open platform takes a little while. I've done right. it once, you know, before getting all the APIs out there, tested, getting the security so you can't pull down so the system. So you're not uh, close to the possibility of being open. You're no, busy. And, and, and in fact, we are um, just going into a private beta, so anybody can. Um, uh, start using the tool set, publishing their own guides and their own oh, brands cool. with their own content, determining ah. how it shows up. So if anybody's um, so I can make the unofficial guide to Universal Studios. Exa exactly, and and, and we well, think see, there's that's a what whole it will be. there's a whole concept. Yeah, somebody this is a somebody should pitch me on this idea and invest in it. Why don't the, somebody do the unofficial iPhone app for these locations? Okay, so I'll, wait, wasn't somebody didn't somebody pitch us on that for uh, Tyler uh, sports stadiums? Or for sports teams, they were doing unofficial for sports teams. Mm. I seem to remember this at one of the Open Angel forums. Anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll pitch you later an unofficial yes. Disney <laughs> guide. Unofficial thing. Disney guide. Yeah. These could be like. You already a whole, have the content. You already a, have the content, yeah, right? As well, there's, I a mean, huge the, book. there's whole books of, yeah, yeah, yeah. With like and, the, and, the and, underground and, guide to yeah. Disneyland and everything. Yeah, you could find that. What's that place called? Room 57 or something like that? <laughs> there's some. There's some 33. 
Room no, 33. Club 33. Club 33? Place, right? Yeah, the upstairs where it's like exclusively invited. I saw invited. the, uh, the one, your co host on uh, this week in YouTube, Cat. Cat, yes. She got right. She got, she to got go there. into it. Uh, yeah. Very good. Okay, uh, let's hear what's in the news. Sure. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with uh, Flipboard. It's a new social media magazine for the iPad. Definitely this week's most talked about hottest iPad uh, app. It got amazing hottest buzz. Hottest startup. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, it got amazing buzz on its release. Uh, they're a startup that's been actually sort of venture back. They've got 10.5 million in the bank. Uh, and it also got a lot of attention because of technical problems that have not allowed most people to actually check it out yet. Uh, the idea is it takes your Twitter and Facebook feeds and converts them into a magazine style layout so that you can read it more like you would a news aggregator or something from RSS, but it's just URLs that's pulling in from Twitter and Facebook. Unfortunately, a server crash soon after the app launched kept the the vast majority of users locked out of the main features. They've since released an upgrade that allows you to enter your email address so they can contact you when they can let you in. And I, uh, I signed up, and then this morning I got an email that said, you're on our list and we'll let you know when we can let you in. So I'm still locked out. Um, so is that kind of thing, I mean, is that a minor detail? It'll eventually work. Everybody will try it, and it'll rise or fall based on its own merits. Or do you think that this kind of crash, when the buzz is at its height, hurts its chances of finding a big audience? Uh, no, it creates a second wave of press. Mm -hmm. And that wave of press says, pay attention to us. It happens all the time. Twitter was down for like 5% of its second year when it got popular. And, and you know, still a and, lot. Well, <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, Facebook was a disaster for me for a long time. Anybody who has a large number of friends knows it could take like minutes to create your feed and it would, logging in would take five minutes. And yeah. it was, I, I, I thought it was me and then other people told me they had the same problem. So uh, typically, no, these aren't, uh, these are, this isn't a major issue. It's, it's um, it's like being super popular and you you know, you can't book them on the Tonight Show or something like that. It's just creates more demand. Right. So uh, when it does, when everybody can get in, there will just be all the same blog posts again, like, hey now you can use it. Yeah, everybody it's just a second, it third way. I mean there are there are there are people that speculate people do this a lot when you know, velvet rope things like this. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's why people do like the Guilt Group in some of these places. Fon Privé have membership only. You know, so it's just it's a marketing strategy. I'm not saying that's what they did this time. They would want to have the thing working, but I wouldn't be surprised if some startup, probably not in this case, did that as a marketing strategy. You know, we're, we're overwhelmed. You know. Please put your name in here, and we'll send you your reservation code. Yeah, well, you know. Hulu doing the same thing. Hulu Plus has been out for weeks. No yeah. one I know has gotten in yet. They're letting the you know the uh, pundits and people in first. Right. And so it's it's a, it's a great waiting. release strategy. The more interesting issue is: is this a legal service or not? Yes, and I have that. That's our, our. We're moving into that right anyway, now. Anyway, what did you, did you look at it this week? <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, uh, Tyler, did you look at it? Or try I to didn't. download. Couldn't get in. Okay. I mean, I could show you. We, uh, you I mean, can, I've seen it. It's basically. If you download it, you get a little preview of, of feeds they've set up, but yeah. you can't actually get to see the Twitter and the Facebook and how that right. would work yet. So it looks at all the tweets that your friends have done. Right. And it says, okay, you tweeted these blog posts, these New York Times stories. Let's rank them in order. Let's grab the photo from the Boston Globe, the New York Times, right. and let's grab an excerpt, the first X number of words, and present it to you in a magazine format. It's like you're personalized newspaper based on your friends are looking at. So and yeah, they're thinking there's going to be another layer they'll eventually add that will actually look at the stories you click on and then start prioritizing them yeah, in that way. So it'll learn that you like movies or you <coughs> like sports or whatever. Uh, this concept has been around for a long time. It's been executed on many times and consumers have generally not cared. Um, people click on the links in their Twitter and so I don't think that this is revolutionary in that way. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of hype. Uh, and people generally want a curated experience. There's a reason why editors exist, and right, yeah. because your friends aren't the best judge of what's interesting. They are a judge of what's interesting, but I would rather have, you know, the, the, there's a, the people who are the editors of Engadget have a better idea of what gadgets I should pay attention to than my friends. Right. Anyway, uh, so anyway, to move on, uh, more on Flipboard. According to a blog post in Gizmodo, they may be violating copyright law by scraping content from sites to which they don't own the rights. Yeah. Uh, Flipboard co-founder Evan Dahl responded to the site, "Quote: Flipboard shows short content previews. We do not <coughs> offer a full article view in Flipboard. If the user wants to read the full article, they tap read on web and are taken to the full site in an embedded browser." Gizmodo goes on to note, however, that plenty of copywritten content, like Boston.com's Big Picture, which sure. is a slideshow of photos 
photos taken from wire services, that entire thing is fully viewable within Flipboard. You don't need to go to Boston.com to see it. So do you, do you think this counts as a fair use? No. And is this like Instapaper, which allows you to pull things from the web and then read it later without it, the no. ads? It's totally different. Uh, this happened with RSS in the early days of blogs. Mm -hmm. If you pull, uh, so the fair use is uh, often uh, misunderstood. But the main tenet of it, and it's a multi-part test, is are you infringing on the person's ability to do commerce and business? So if I get it from this and I don't go to the website, mm -hmm. did I infringe upon their ability to do business and right. do commerce? And the answer is yes. If I look, what, what do people do in newspapers? They read the headline, they read the first sentence or the last sentence, or the, and they look at the photo, and they move on to the next one. That's the majority of people's behavior. So this uh, is an unfair application. Shame mm -hmm. on the people who built it. They should know better. Uh, and um, they're going to fall back on the, well, you can, app, you can opt out. Well, that's not how copyright works. Copyright works is you have to get permission. Right. Uh, so that's kind of a bogus one. If they were showing thumbnail images, they would be fine. They're not showing thumbnail images. If they were showing uh, limit, so if they show thumbnail, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to fall back to showing thumbnails which is going to ruin the experience of the big, beautiful photos. Right. Um, just like Google Images only shows thumbnails. They're going to have to move to only showing maybe the first sentence and the headline, or maybe even, so that's going to kill the service. Right. The whole so idea it is, will yeah, basically like look like yeah. Google News. So it, the, the, as amazing as, the, uh, as this is, it's too good to be true. And they will get stopped. And the New York Times says people have stopped other people from doing this. Uh, it, if you want to look at the historical nature of this, Total News, uh, when framing came out, mm -hmm. RSS feeds, I personally stopped NewsGator, Bloglines, and Yahoo from either taking the full feed and putting ads against it, which is what some of these RSS readers actually did to yeah, our content. Definitely. They were going out selling Engadget and Autoblog and saying, not only were they selling Engadget, they were selling Engadget and Gizmodo and Slashdot. So they would go out with a better sales package than Engadget could go out because they would sell our two competitors. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, we have 18,000 people subscribed on this feed uh, across these three feeds. I will sell you those 18,000 people. We go to a sales meeting, they'd say, oh, well, we just had this RSS company in here. So then I threatened to sue those RSS companies. Mm -hmm. And even worse, I said, I will block your service from reading our RSS feed. So, and I will put in our RSS feed your, this service is not supported by Engadget because they still content. Please use these two competitors who respect content creators. Right, yeah. And once I told them that, I'm a little bit of a gangster, right? <laughs> people, they were like, why are you such a jerk? And I said, well, I'm not the one stealing content. If you steal from me and then you get smacked down, keep your hand out of my cookie jar, you know? Yeah. Like if you crawl through somebody's window and they shoot you, it's not the shooter's fault. It's the person who crawled through the window. These people are stealing. They know they're stealing they need to go to opt-in only. And until they do that, they will be stopped. I guarantee you New York Times and Wall Street Journal will have letters to these people immediately. And I don't care how much Robert Scoble likes it. Robert Scoble had the same position on RSS. Oh, well, users have to love it. You know, it's like, but the, the users loving it is not the test. The test is do you infringe on the original copyright owners? And I know this because Mahalo does a lot of searches and you know, abstracts. Yeah. And I always think about, am I infringing on the person's right? That's why we don't show big, full photos. If we do, we yeah. have permission. Anyway, this is, uh, somebody's talking about Jason Cockett. No, no, it's a, that's, that's a spammer. Don't worry. Oh, a spammer, okay. He's been, he's that. been around before. We've, we've kicked him before. Oh, okay. Sorry, I see a spammer. Anyway, okay. what, do you, what do you think about this stuff, the, the scraping um, of content? Yeah, so, so, so I think there's an interesting point of, of the rights, but I, I think what you find in the industry is that what is technically possible and good for users ends up happening somehow. Yeah. Um, so it may be this company, it may be that they have to cut these deals, it may be they get less of the money, it may be their margins go way down. Yeah. But if they can create something great that's a great experience, it will manifest itself well, into a legal business model at some point. Right, and some point I guess would be the question. I mean, yeah. your, your original idea of you know, Rhapsody took a long time. It took a very, very long time. And, and, and technically ad, it was possible, you know, Right, and the, the ad-supported Rhapsody never Materialize. So a lot of people said that would happen. Yeah, I'd be able to just have an ad-supported one, and the music industry hasn't let it happen. Nor do I have the database of every single movie I can watch on demand. I mean, Netflix is only a small percentage of the movies available. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's becoming a pretty significant library. But yes, they only. It's they, insignificant. Uh, the when I when I type in a film, I, it, every film I want to see is not 
it not available on streaming. And I, I the thing I have, you got to turn the uh, parental control off. <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't have porn on Netflix. No, you know what the thing is? People, bra the reason they have a watch instantly tab mm -hmm. is because so few of the films are able to watch instantly. So well, if you start okay, from watch instantly, the, if you take the total sum of film history, yes, uh, it's not a big. I like sci-fi. And I like zombie films. Mm -hmm. You go to the sci-fi category, it is so anemic, it's pathetic. You go to the the zombie one, none of the good zombie films are on there. Zombie Land, they just put that up. I they they have I'm thinking maybe five percent of the, the movies are available. Yeah, stream. no, I mean it's it's, so it's, it's, it's it's getting better. It'll somebody, it'll take them some time. Warner Brothers actually just uh, let them have access to like a couple thousand more titles that was just announced, so they're they're getting they're going to get better and and what they're doing is they're scaling back on new releases in favor of archive titles. So over the course of months, we'll start. I seeing heard more about a up. subscription service for rich people with home theaters mm -hmm. that is tens of thousands of dollars, but it allows you, per year. Mm -hmm. But it allows you to have every single film on the planet available for streaming. Well, if you're paying that much, I mean, I guess somebody could make it. Anybody with know if this is true? I haven't heard about that, but that's a, that sounds amazing. There is some subscription service I've heard. Just like you, you had the newspaper service where you pay one big. Oh my gosh! How amazing is that? Press Reader. Press Reader. Explain. Press to Reader is this. Press Reader is the app. Uh, newspaper Direct is the company. Yep. Press Reader, the app is. Uh, they're they're sponsoring our iPad show now. Oh, they're a sponsor. I didn't they're know a sponsor of our iPad show. So disclaimer, but I can show it to you right now. Uh, you can oh, actually access pretty much. I mean, they have. 15,000 newspapers from like 80 some countries. But it's the actual newspaper. It's the full, I mean, well, you'll see, I, I subscribe to The Times, so it's downloading to today's LA but Times. But it's 30 bucks. It's the full. Can you turn that around to point it to a camera? Yeah, it is the full, I know it's hard, it, there you go. It's the full, I mean, this is yesterday's LA Times complete. This is the front page like of the calendar section. Like with the ads. Everything. I mean, it's literally like it's PDFs. It's a scan of the paper. It's a scan of the entire that's paper. That's what I want from my and Wall Street Journal app. You can Why see don't here, they give me that? Even look at that table of contents. I can jump to any section I want instantly. That's, and what, even it, why they'll, is, they'll that's what everybody wants. They'll highlight links and they'll highlight email addresses. So if it says like email our writer and it gives you the email, uh, you so can somebody actually has to manually click do it. That. So they're editing it too. So and this is what I like is that you actually see the Bristol Farms ad that was in the paper. Yeah. But you don't get that in the Wall Street Journal. It's like going to the library and looking at the entire. But it's thirty paper. bucks for every it's, newspaper. You can get it. The app is free. You can pay a dollar for any one paper that you want. You can pay ten bucks and you get thirty-one papers a month. So you could basically subscribe to one paper every day, or you pay thirty and you get every paper that they have in their archive for free. So I could be reading like newspapers from Japan. I've got you. They have Japan. I, I have a. I, just insane. to test it out, I downloaded a Pakistani newspaper in here. I mean, here's all the different countries you could see. Ridiculous. Canada. They've got 278 right, Canadian enough, papers. Enough, enough, enough. I, don't, I, I didn't know they were an advertiser, so I don't feel like I'm pimping for an advertiser. What's they the name of it again? Uh, Press Reader. Is Press the name Reader of available uh, in the App Store now. Go check it out. That is a pretty cool thing. Next story. It's crazy. Okay, next story. Uh, so last month we discussed Disney's investment of 33 million in Playdom via its venture capital arm Steamboat Ventures. Yes. This brought the total investment in Playdom to 76 million dollars at a valuation of about 345 million. Uh -huh. Now it appears that Disney may be prepared to acquire Playdom outright. Hmm. According to TechCrunch, the deal is all but made and is being referred to internally as Project Platinum. Uh, Disney also recently acquired iPhone game publisher Tapulous, makers of mm -hmm. Tap Tap Revolution. So no word yet on what price Disney is prepared to pay for Playdom. We should note that Zynga, Playdom's main but much larger competitor, has been valued at about $2 billion. So do you think this deal is going to happen, and uh, does this deal make sense for Disney? Um, Disney desperately needs to be in the game space. They have all these incredible properties, including yeah. they what Marvel, right? Disney has Marvel properties, yeah. I mean, Pixar. just think about the possibilities with Pixar, Marvel, and Disney for casual games, iPhone games, Facebook games. I mean, multiplayer yeah. games. I mean, they have to have something. They can't get Zynga, so they might as well buy the number two. Uh, and TechCrunch is never wrong about these things. So, I would. I shouldn't say TechCrunch is never wrong. They did say Twitter was going to get bought by Google for a billion dollars for a while. <laughs> That's true. Uh, no, I mean they're facetious. usually right on. I about would say this stuff. that. When it comes to acquisitions, generally they're more right than wrong, which is a pretty, you know, when you're batting over 500 on rumors, that's pretty good. So chances are it's probably going to happen, or it's leaked by the investment bank that's doing the deal who wants to, or some employee who really wants to buy a Porsche or a Tesla, I should say. Yeah, you, you know, but I mean, it sounds crazy, but that's where these leaks come from. I mean, people have agendas, so it, it could be somebody inside of Disney who wants to get the deal done. Right. It could be a banker who wants to get the deal done. It could be any of those things, and they could be leaking it. Um, 
Somebody in the chat room said, did you see the Business Insider article during the week about Jason trying to sell Mahalo? I, I, I did. That one is false. Uh, if Trust me, if there was a $700 million offer here, we would all be in Vegas right now. <laughs> We'd be in Vegas right now. I mean, $700 million is a that's lot a, of money. It's a lot of scratch. <laughs> anyway, what do you think? You want to follow in the game space? Um, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about the game space is if it's, if it's you know, the question is, what is the asset there? Is it the, the, the people and their knowledge of the, the game? Because it's a little bit of like a hit business, like a studio business. And, yeah. you know, when you buy a studio, that may or may not work so Miramax. well. So, um, <laughs> so, 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 look, I think that's different than the dynamic of if you buy Twitter, it's a network, it, it, it's got its yeah. own momentum. They don't have to reinvent themselves every, you know, six months or something like that. So, right. Talk so. about timing of the selling. You know, sell after you, you know, Farmville comes out or something. Yeah, you know, right. whatever. Interesting. Um, okay, next story. Uh, so we'll talk about. Uh, we got to talk about this Facebook lawsuit this week. I saw you tweeting about it earlier. Uh, by now, everybody's heard about the lawsuit filed by New York-based lawyer Paul Argentieri, alleging that he he's saying on behalf of a client he paid Mark Zuckerberg two thousand. Uh, back in 2003 to create two different sites, one of which was then called The Facebook. Right. Uh, this is, of course, a year before we traditionally think of Facebook being invented yep. by Zuckerberg at Harvard. Uh, Argenieri has delivered one document to the court which appears to be signed by a Mark Zuckerberg and which promises to split 50-50 ownership in Facebook with Argentieri's client, Paul Seglia, in exchange for a fee of $1,000. Uh, additionally, the contract promises Seglia a 1% stake in Facebook for every day the site was late, so the lawsuit is 84% of the company now, plus damages. Um, though admitting that Zuckerberg once worked for Seglia, Facebook has replied that it strongly suspects forgery is involved, and it called the lawsuit absurd. Uh, Zuckerberg told ABC World News this week, quote, we were quite sure that we did not sign a contract that says they have any right to ownership over Facebook. Much has been made of his use of we instead of I in right. that sentence. Um, Argentieri says he has documents to back up his claim and called the claims of forgery reckless and absurd. Uh, Wired actually has uh, an embedded copy of It's on the, Docstock. Yeah, it's on Scribd and Docstock as well. It's on Docstock. Uh, it's on Docstock. We don't say that other word. <laughs> any, so is there any reason to believe that this is actually a valid case? Um, especially when you consider that Seglia was indicted in New York in 2009 on charges of defrauding people who paid him for heating supplies he never delivered. Okay, so the defrauding... Facebook saying you shouldn't trust this guy because he defrauded what, is pretty the, laughable because mm -hmm. Facebook's what, been involved what, in multiple lawsuits. What's his eBay score? Paul Seglia. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I can tell you it's higher than Zuckerberg. It can't be that good because he says he was going to sell people heating supplies and they never yeah. got them. Uh, it's, a, it's a good insight, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler. Um, what I would say is, uh, number one, them, uh, you know, bringing up other lawsuits is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, Facebook settled the Beacon lawsuit for $10 million. They settled the with the Wiki Brothers with the, the Winklevoss Winklevoss Winkle Brothers. Bosses. He settled the lawsuit with um, Eduardo with Saverin. Yeah, Saverin. I mean, Zuckerberg is the king of lawsuits that claim he is a liar, deceitful, yeah. untrustworthy, uh, and this is you know, I, I don't want to become the face the anti Facebook guy, mm -hmm. which is why I don't comment on it anymore, and I've left the haters behind for the rest of the year and right. Facebook, but you're bringing it up, it's a news story, I have to comment it's a, on it. It's a big news story right now. Uh, Zuckerberg is not an honest person, in my estimation. I can't get sued for liable, but that's my opinion. Right. I think he is a liar, in fact. I think he's a dishonest liar. And I, this is why I've been getting a lot of heat from my friends who own shares in the company and who are threatening me and trying to get me to get off this topic. Mm -hmm. I would get off this topic if the lawsuits didn't keep mounting. And they don't, they, they say, he, they're now, they, they originally denied, if you look at Facebook's reaction to this, it looks really suspicious. They're not denying that he worked for him. Mm -hmm. They're using this weird language. Uh, there's a contract that says the Facebook, which is actually what they called it, the Facebook. The thought was there in the early the days. The thought was they there in, in the Harvard days. So yeah. this is looking really bad. And now you have to, the worst part about this is gonna have to remake the movie. <laughs> the movie's not going to be accurate. They're going to have to do an epilogue. They should literally do an epilogue at the end of the film. They should have this lawsuit start and then put Facebook part two. You know, the social network The social network, social network uh, they again. They set up the second part, which is another lie, another level of deceit, another level of departure, if it's true. So we don't know in this case if it's true. Yeah. Uh, why did this person take so long? 
Yeah, that's that's, that's a weird, the weird part. That's the only weird part. 2003, and he's been waiting all this time. And actually, there There's is a timing issue. He's just looking for the best exit. And right? there, there exactly. Is actually, what? Actually, he's an entrepreneur with that contract. That. There is a law in New York State that you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed if you have a claim yes. against a company, you can't wait for them to become profitable before you sue. I yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, I, I, that sounds like a very uh, niche kind of law that you, know, you have to make that claim, but mm -hmm. um, he's, I, I guarantee that this will be, Zuckerberg will settle this, mm -hmm. uh, and he'll settle it for tens of millions of dollars. We won't hear the end of it, but this, right. this person's gonna get paid off. It probably was true. It, it seems to me like he signed it. I don't there think is, somebody would. They have a contract that's signed yes. by a Mark Zuckerberg. Now maybe it's for. He's saying it's the, forged. The, the idea that somebody would forge a contract, find a lawyer, and go to court about it mm -hmm. would—it's so dangerous to do that. You can go to jail you can for go that. Go to jail. That's true. That's so true. I think the cost of forging a document and going this far to trial is insanely high for the person. You know. Yeah. So unless the person is mentally disturbed and insane, which they, there's no evidence that that came out, and trust me, Facebook's lawyers are looking for that. I mean, they're digging up every ounce of dirt they can find on this guy. I'm sure, yeah. And, you know, like this heating, the heating supply thing. So, it's this is not looking good, um, but with the six years going by, I'm not a lawyer, I, I can't imagine that it's going to, he's gonna wind up with 84%. That seems high. <laughs> but I can't imagine that this is not gonna cost Facebook something and it's not real. It is real. And so, I, it, what, one of the things is now there is a there is a Zuckerberg Facebook distortion field now, where anytime he gets hit with a lawsuit, their success makes the lawsuit hard to believe. But the trust in him and the company is pretty low. I think people look at him as a very suspicious character now, which I think he's earned that reputation. Uh, and I think the movie is going to, plus this, is going to really damage his reputation. I think this yeah. Diane Sawyer thing and... It definitely well, looks like the movie's going to be oh, it's gonna yeah, decimate a bit of I mean, a hatchet Well, job. I mean, doing like, uh, I'm a creep, uh, you know, doing creep. Yeah, they're playing radio their radios on creep, and he I, just looks so, like, awkward. Well, I mean, I think and, yeah. there is something to be said for the fact that the guy's not trustworthy. Uh, and I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but that's my personal opinion based mm -hmm. upon the facts I see. I would not trust the person, but he may have changed. Maybe he's a changed person. Uh, Anyway, Raul, tell us uh, how untrustworthy you think Mark Zuckerberg is. Um, I know, I don't put you on the spot. Like, <laughs> he's like, I have to I, work in this industry. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, what do you think of the whole situation? You following it at all? I, I, I kind of feel like it's just not interesting to me. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, what happened back then and, you, you know, this guy doing it, it's like, like I think what's much more interesting is like, you know, Facebook's, Changing the internet, you know, creating companies like Zynga off of it. They yeah. say they're going to be a mobile platform. They're, you know, releasing things in mobile. Like it's, um, uh, and and when I look at Facebook as a company, it's like, wow, this is creating a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. Um, at the end of the day, like, what happened ten years ago is just yeah. not high on my radar. Uh, Agree to a certain extent, and I am going to put into all of my contracts that if anything's late, I get another one percent. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. That's I like this clause. Good clause. Yeah. Good clause. Every good clause. month it's late, one percent, oh. Tyler. One percent. <laughs> Clock is ticking, Mr. T. Next story, and then we got to get out of here because it's three o'clock, yeah. and I know that at four o'clock we have a new lineup. This week in social media, well, will that's, be starting. that's actually next week. Starting next week. That's next week. So starting next week, one p.m. this week in startups, four p.m. this week in social media, six p.m. this week in mobile. That's right. It's We're like your internet block. It's like your right, the web uh, gadget block. Yeah, love it. Uh, so you, I'll give you your choice about which uh, the final story. We've got Kiss Metrics. We've got Trada, a sponsor in the news, and Bettable, a betting, Twitter for betting. Oh, I'll it. go with the Bettable. All right. Bettable.com, you can pull it up, is a new site. Users create their own bets and then share them with Love friends. It. The company is describing themselves as Twitter for betting, although I thought Zynga for betting might actually be more accurate. Hoping to be a place where regular people who would like to place bets with friends can go online and organize these sorts of ventures easily. Here's how it works. Bettable takes 10% of the profits on all bets. Users get 30 The juice! Users get 30% of the proceeds from any bet they've created. So there's a lot of incentive to create. You want to be the person who makes the bet. Wait, uh, what is the person who makes the bet? You get 30% of the total proceeds if you are the one who 
arranges the initial bet. What? Yeah. So there's a lot. There's, so there's a double vig. They're 40%? incentivizing making the bet. Oh. Like they want you to be the one who enters the bet. Uh, Love here, it. Uh, and then anyone who places a bet has their money taken up front to guarantee that the eventual winner gets paid. Uh, bets can be shared on Facebook or Twitter automatically, so your friends don't have to already be on Bettable for you to invite them to join you in a bet. Uh, and because it's social, they're hoping that that is cuts down on the scamming. You wouldn't pretend that you won a bet you didn't win, or you wouldn't lie about stuff, because then your reputation would be diminished on the site. Uh, the company's launched in the UK because the gambling laws are a little looser there, but their whole team, including CEO and founder Christopher Griffin, is actually here in the States. Uh, the company just secured a $3 million... Uh, wait, 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 wait. The team is here. The team's all in America, but they've launched it. You can see it's all in pounds right now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They've whoa, launched whoa, it in the whoa, UK. Whoa, whoa. So they launched a gambling site. Yes. Built in the United States, and yes. the executives are in the United States. Yes. But it operates off of a server over there. I, I guess it's hosted and it's launched in the UK only for so so far. Uh, but it's actually because it's probably got sticky legal issues here in yeah. the US. Well, where, I just clicked here. I mean, I know these issues. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I just clicked and it says we are currently offering betting services only in the UK. You right. will not be able to wager. So they're, they're, they're blocking by IP. Yeah. You know what this reminds me of? What's that, Tyler? Chinese skywriting. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Something doesn't seem right about this. Like, if some guy was trying to sell services for Chinese skywriting, you, something just doesn't quite add up. It is Chinese skywriting. I mean, how is that possible? Fair enough. I mean, the characters are so complex. Uh, right. right. I, I understand the metaphor. It doesn't yeah. seem possible. I mean, it would have to be like a series of jet fighters to do that. Yes. Got it. Yeah, you would need a team. To uh, I'm Chinese looking at it right now. Uh huh. They, so they just secured a $3 million uh, funding round from Atomico, a fund created by Skype founders Nicholas Zenstrom and Giannis Fries, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of surprising. A uh, VC firm taking a stake in what? I guess there's a social no, 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 element, it's not. but it's I mean, you have, a you, you have Betfair and uh, InTrade and a bunch of these gambling sites in the UK. Uh, what this points to is the United States needs to redo their gambling laws because we're sending jobs overseas and people should be able to do what they want with their money. It does seem like what's the harm in me being allowed to, because this is not for gambling addicts. There's Betfair and a lot of other ways for gambling addicts Trust to get their fix Trust me, gambling without. addicts, just like people who smoke weed, are going to find their fix. Yeah, it's like, this is, this is you know, I can drink five cups of coffee in ten minutes, or those kind of fun bets. It's not that kind of compulsive bet. It's a great you idea. You can't bet that, can you? Like, how, how no. You can, you, no, that's, you can, that, you could. that's an example that they actually, really? I, I didn't make that example up. Uh, yeah, they, they want you. They want it to be that kind of social. And then betting. you like video it. And, you and then I the guess right. Well, that's what they're saying. Like who they, judges if the they're trying that you have witnesses or you film yourself doing hmm. it. Um, so that that's what they're saying is they're trying to cut down on the scam element because people could create bets that they could then sort of. And who's the judge? Fake. Who decides? That that's a good that's a good question. All right. Well, here we go. How will Amit do in his poker game this weekend? Amit is playing poker this weekend with some friends. Right. Will he win or lose money? It'll be Texas Hold'em cash game. Uh, plus a tournament or two. The bet is whether overall I'll be winning or losing money. Even will count as losing closest I, I, tomorrow. I think you could use this really effectively. Like, you know, will I get a date with this person? You can kind of yeah. bet against yourself. And so, like, if you do, you win. If you don't, you, you say get, you can hedge. Like a, oh, you, you, you yeah, hedge you your bets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, you, you can hedge your whole life using this mm -hmm. All right. System. So this week in .com will sell for $15 million or... Not. <laughs> and if I can get somebody to wager $15 million, then it won't. There you go. I break even. Okay. That's called balancing your juice if you're a bookie. Uh, it's a great idea. I think that you, if you operate, can, I guess an American company can operate a gambling thing overseas. It just can't operate one well, that's in the United States. I'm pretty sure the only law that actually has passed and is enforceable right now is American banks aren't allowed to yeah. send money back and forth from gambling right. sites. So that would cut down on my ability to send money to Bettable, but if you know somebody in London wants to, a million ways to do it. You yeah, get, I mean anybody can get a credit card from a bank overseas, open an online account, and mm. then use their credit card from the UK or whatever. Just, it's, it's so obvious. This is, this is why, in a global economy, if you want to be competitive, you have to change these regulations and stop sending full tilt poker, you know, poker yeah. stars. All these companies go overseas. Yeah, I mean the gambling thousands ones, of jobs. It, it makes sense in a zoning. Billions of like, dollars in tax. It makes sense in a zoning way. Like we don't want casinos everywhere, and Who it cares? brings it. I, I mean, I, I I don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand the point. But what's the point of telling Card people they room can't in bet Brentwood with their friends wonderful. in uh, you know on, online? Like, what's the harm there? Love to have a poker room in Santa Monica. 
That would be fun. It would be nice. You know the play. local government people. What would it take to get a poker room in Santa Monica? Uh, check into that. For yeah. You. I should be able to create a... There was a Beverly Hills Poker Club. I don't know exactly how that worked. But I think if the house doesn't take a rake, you could have that. So I was I was actually thinking about starting a poker club like in Brentwood or in Santa Monica. And then uh, you basically have dealers there. You tip the dealers to pay for their services. Mm -hmm. So the dealers just operate there like as free yeah. agents or whatever. And then uh, you just have to be a member of the club and members pay whatever it is, $2,000 mm -hmm. a year or something like that. And you can get an on-site membership for $500 yeah. for the first month and reoccurring every month or something. So if you want to play in the games, you got to pay a membership fee to be part of the club. But you're not paying for the poker, the poker, but you know, right. no, no house takes no rake. Just a game. Just a game. Is that legal? They could, uh, they could hold it at schools and give the money to the school. Well, it's got to be semi-legal because there's commerce and bicycle <laughs> and... I'd rather, I'd rather the money go to a school and... than to whoever the guy is. No offense to the guy who's making the rake money, but... I'd rather see that money go to better use. Semi-legal is a good test. If it's semi-legal, yeah. I'd... Yeah, semi-legal, yeah. of course. Uh, it's a test Zuckerberg uses. Is it semi-ethical? Yeah. Uh, okay, this has been a wonderful show. Raul Sanad, thank you for coming on. Geodelic, Geodelic. Everybody check out Geodelic, G-E-O-D-E-L-I-C, or at Geodelic uh, on Twitter. Uh, great startup. Really great history of the entrepreneurship. The, I know that all the entrepreneurs listening really appreciate it. Thank you for being so honest. And I can honestly tell you that I love Trada, T-R-A-D-A, -A, Trada, Trada, Trada. Uh, boy, they're going to give you $100 worth of PPC marketing for free uh, with every thousand you spend up to a limit of $3,000-$300 bonus. If you use the term twist, if you do uh, use the product, just like with the .co uh, thing we had on Tuesday, the promotion, always tweet that you use the products. That's how we get these sponsors. That's how we pay Lon's outrageous salary demands and Tyler's catering truck. Um, it's not cheap to do what we do here, and uh, we need all the support we can get from great sponsors like Trotta and, of course, DNA Mail, DNA Mail. Everybody loves DNA Mail. Follow them on Twitter and tell them you appreciate it. Uh, next week, 1 p.m. This Week in Startups, 4 p.m. This Week in Social Media, 6 p.m. This Week in Mobile. What a great uh, Great guest next week, too. Adam Bernard from Outlook. 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 Yet we'll another... Us. Uh, deal site. It'll be great. And uh, there's no show on Tuesday. I'm going to be going to New York for the Open Angel Forum, which is next Thursday. And then we have the Open Angel Forum in August in Boulder. I'll be going to Boulder. I'll also Over be in Friday. London in October. Yes. And I will be in uh, the launch conference will be February 23rd and 24th next year. And I'll have big launch announcements shortly. Big news coming in August for the launch conference. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Spiked out, I could trip a referee Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from you.